be here with us this morning logging in hopefully you're able to see us and hear us okay uh, my name is Darina and I'm going to be one of your presenters today along with Christina who you'll meet shortly and we're so so honored and so happy and privileged to be here with you this morning on such an amazing day um, pity we couldn't be here in person but at least we're so lucky that we have the internet to be able to connect with each other so we have a jam-packed schedule for you today it's going to be really fast moving with so many interesting conversations, um, perspectives and advice on how to rebuild and revitalize the pro-life movement in Ireland. So I'm looking really forward to everything, all the videos, all the interviews and everything everyone has to say today. And I'm sure you are as well. Um, so sit back, relax if you can. I know there's a bit of a storm brewing outside, so hopefully it's not too bad where you are. Grab a cup of coffee, a tea, your preferred beverage, and uh, we'll get straight into it. So today's theme, or this year's conference, the theme is, as you can see behind me, 7,000 too many, which refers to the 6,666 abortions that took place in Ireland in 2019, as well as the 375 abortions on Irish women who traveled to England in the same time period. That's a total of 7,041 abortions in one year. That's such a heartbreaking and devastating figure. I'm sure you think the same. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of issues today, but front and center, we really want to focus on thinking about how we can reduce this rate of abortion in Ireland. Um, so with that in mind, we're going to start with a video uh, to introduce today. Um, and it's going to be looking at a reflection um, and it was filmed right after uh, the release of the abortion um, statistics and then we'll follow it with a studio discussion. So I hope you enjoy it and I'll see you back in a minute. Before the abortion referendum in 2018, 
Leo Varadkar reassured voters that in the event of repeal, abortions would be safe, legal and rare. Simon Harris told the Dáil that in countries with legalised abortion, abortion rates routinely decline. Dr Peter Boylan was emphatic that the rate of abortion goes down when abortion is legalised. And Michal Martin told the Dáil that there was no sound basis for the claim that as a result of repeal, Ireland's abortion rates would inevitably increase. Like so many claims made at that time, they were spectacularly wrong. When the official figures were released this week showing a massive increase in abortion, all four men were nowhere to be seen. 7,000 lives lost in one year is a devastating number and represents a doubling of the abortion rate in just 12 months. In the Ireland of 2020, if you are unsure as to whether you want to go through with your pregnancy, the only agencies the state will put you in touch with are councillors who will facilitate abortion with nothing to offer regarding positive alternatives to abortion. This is a national scandal and has to change. As the pro-life campaign statement said earlier this week, the state-sponsored choreography in favour of abortion must end immediately and must give way to an honest and open debate about the alarming impact of repeal. The victims of abortion deserve nothing less. If you aren't already involved, consider getting involved in the pro-life campaign today and help us to protect unborn children and support their mothers. Get in touch today. Okay, welcome back everybody. I hope you enjoyed that video. Um, it's very thoughtful and inspiring. I'm sure you'll uh, agree with me. So in the studio, um, we have Eilish Mulroy, who you would have seen from the Pro-Life Campaign, who was featured in that video. It's so good to have you, Eilish. Thanks, Dorina. Thanks for, it's great to be here today. Um, and it's really great to welcome so many volunteers and supporters from all around Ireland yeah. to be on this event. Brilliant. Um, so before, just quickly before we get into discussing um, the topic of today and the theme <coughs> and um, just before we get into discussing the video, uh, would you like to say a few words about today's conference and just give us, um, tell people what they can expect from today? Of course, sure. Of, um, usually, of course, we're in the um, ODS concert hall uh, every year for this conference, so it's very different to um, have to be online as, yeah. as everyone is in these strange times we're living in. We were very determined that this event would, would go ahead and you know the benefit of being online is that there'll be many people tuning in today that might not necessarily have travelled to Dublin for our conference, mm -hmm. our friends in other countries, many people around the country that, that wouldn't be able to get to Dublin. So that's really good. So you know we want to really issue a special welcome to people who are tuning in to this event uh, for the first time. Um, we have a lot to look forward to in today's programme. Uh, we have a chock-a-block programme with interviews with influencers. Um, and you know pro-life activists from Ireland and all around the world and you know one of the really encouraging things um, for all of us in the movement in the campaign as well has been the resilience shown by pro-life activists in recent times mm -hmm. you know the pro-life movement like any movement across time in history we have peaks and troughs and it's been really encouraging and reassuring to see how people are willing to really be committed and continue to be committed uh, to this cause um, and I really hope that all of the brilliant volunteers and activists and supporters all over the country today get a lot out of today's event. Yeah, I'm sure they definitely will. I'm super excited to hear everything that has to be said and to get that motivation and inspiration back, um, especially after those figures that we just heard earlier. So to get back to the theme um, of today and the video, it's very informative, a lot of information there. And I was actually so happy to see that's over 100,000 views on Facebook so far. That's such a great achievement. Um, and I'm so happy that the message is getting out there and it's being shared. So please, if you haven't watched the video, go um, and share it with your friends who maybe haven't watched and don't know uh, what's happening at the moment. Um, one of the things that really struck me about that video was the fact that there are no counselling services with state backing that provide positive alternatives of abortion in Ireland. I think for a lot of people watching today, that's going to be something that is a harsh reality and one that you can... It's very hard to fathom 
you know. Sadly, that's true, Darina. Mm. And the situation is actually worse than that, in fact. Mm. I, I mean, I'd go as far as to say that there's militant opposition yeah. uh, to any counselling services that are mm. offering positive alternatives to women. And, you know, people might think, well, that's strong language. But in fact, it's true. And I think it's really important that we fight for those women and we make sure that we do our very our level best in the coming days, weeks, months, years to ensure that we have a good counselling services that offer positive alternatives to women. Um, I mean, and many people in the pro-life movement um, will, uh, over the course of being a pro-life activist, we've often met with women who will say, you know, if only somebody had offered me a helping hand, if only somebody had offered me some practical support, if only somebody had told me that I could do it, maybe I would have kept my baby. And that's really heartbreaking uh, for, for people to hear. So if people want, if, if we take anything at all from today's program and from today's event, it should be a, a recommitment to the idea of ensuring that women are given all of those, you know, positive alternatives, that women don't feel that the only option, uh, you know, is to go down the road um, of abortion mm -hmm. um, and not to have good pregnancy counselling services undermined and, in fact, to have pregnancy counselling services that offer positive alternatives promoted and supported by the state. Um, one final thought, Dina, just before we start is, you know, sometimes it, it's, it can be difficult, you know, and, and again, you know, we, we often talk about the resilience of the pro-life movement yeah. um, with, you know, some of the disappointments. And, you know, we see disappointments from time to time. And, yeah. and obviously the, the loss of our precious Eighth Amendment was, was a, a disappointment to us. Yeah. But there are always, um, you know, there are always, um, we can always make progress. And if you look at even this week, um, the story from Poland where the Constitutional Court there um, uh, th there was a challenge there and, and mm -hmm. abortions on the basis of discrimination, Down syndrome, etc. Mm -hmm. have been outlawed. That's a really good news story and it's important for us as pro-life activists to see that and to realise that you know, no matter what the challenges are, we can always make progress and that's why I'm very excited um, for today's event to hearing from people from, from other countries about, about the positive change that can be made if we remain committed. So I really hope everyone enjoys the rest of the programme today. That was brilliant. Thank you so much for that inspiring, um, that inspiring message. Um, so we're going to go over to Christina now uh, for some announcements. So, uh, and I think it's a virtual housekeeping business. It's called now in the in the virtual world. So I'll hand it over to Christina now. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Darina, and hello to all of you tuning in today. My name is Christina, and I am delighted to be co-hosting this event with Darina and Wendy and the whole team. As Ayush said, it is such a pity that we can't meet in person here today. I've attended many conferences myself and it, I do really miss the atmosphere around it. But one really positive statistic to come out of this is that throughout all of the social media platforms, we're realizing that more people that would typically, typically attend the Pro-Life Natural national conference are attending the virtual one here today which is such an amazing thing and we need to cling to these things in these challenging times these positive and unexpected things can i encourage attendees today to please use the hashtag hashtag plc 2020 on facebook on instagram on twitter to help promote the event also we want to make this as interactive as humanly possible so if you have anything you'd like to say, any comments or thoughts on the different videos and speakers that we have, please, if you're watching this on Facebook or YouTube, comment in the comments section and we'll do our best to share these throughout the day. Also, just to let you know, we will be having a short break, a five minute break where you can put the kettle on, top up your cup of tea or coffee, so don't worry about that. And now I'm going to be handing you over to Wendy Grace for her interview with Rachel McKenzie. Rachel is one of the most committed and effective pro-life advocates in Britain. She courageously shares her own personal experience of abortion. Rachel, or our Rachel, thank you so much. So Rachel, I think it would be really great for you to just share with us a little bit of your own story. You have been incredibly courageous just being so open and honest about really the driving force behind why you're so passionate about this issue. Tell us a little bit about your story. So, yeah, so I had two abortions uh, many, many years ago, and I covered up my grief with using um, different types of self-harm from drink, drugs, relationships, until eventually I got some help that I needed to actually 
dig out what the real problem was, which was I was grieving my children. I was grieving the children that I'd killed through abortion. And um, I really got that help and that healing from Rachel's Vineyard. Uh, part of my story is quite um, unique in as much as I was awake for my second abortion. And because I was awake, I watched the abortionist count the body parts of Jude. That's my second son's name. And um, really, God's used that for me. And he's used my story, um, as shocking as it is, to get out there, to make people wake up, really, and see the reality of abortion for what it is. Um, and that's what really drives me forward today. And if I can stand up and say, I've had an abortion, it very often enables other people to say me too. And the most holiest of people I have met in churches and in different denominations across the country and the world that have actually come up to me, you'd never think, well, they've had an abortion because it's such a dark secret. So that's the real reason I do what I do, to allow other people to And speak Rachel, up. just thinking back to that time, you know, the other narrative that would be told is, well, you were exercising your right to choose. This was an empowering choice. How do you feel about those sorts of stories that are told on the pro-choice side of things? I think um, I think on the the, the pro-abort side, because um, I, I feel quite passionately about calling them for what they really are, which is they want abortion. They want it openly and freely for everybody. And they're not really into choices. So I always say, no, the, for the pro-aborts, they they would rather that I, I was quiet and would just disappear because I actually speak about the reality of abortion. And I truly believe in choice. I believe I have a choice to have this crazy pink hair of mine. I have married or single. I have many, many choices. But there are other choices that are taken away from me that I don't really have a choice whether I want to take heroin because it's illegal. I don't really have a choice whether to wear a seatbelt because I have to wear one. So we, there are some choices that are already limited. And, you know, Rachel, at the time when you think back to those abortions, was there people kind of telling you one story saying, you know, you're right to choose and this will make this this issue, this problem go away. And then what was your experience like? Oh, well, well, there's two things there. Firstly, um, I think your choice has to stop when it's when it actually impinges on somebody else's choice. And when my choice meant that I took away the life of somebody else, that's where choice has to stop. Um, I wasn't told about choice because my abortions were decades ago and it wasn't as open as it is today. So I didn't have anybody telling me this was my right to choose. And I also didn't have anybody telling me, you know, you're actually killing your children here. And if we really want choice, surely choice has to be that we know everything that's going to happen. And I didn't realise what I was doing that day. What, what would you say to a woman who would maybe be considering an abortion? Um, well, first of all, I've never, I've never actually met anybody that regrets making the choice of life to actually carry on with that, you know, with that pregnancy. And the whole reason why we have nine months is to prepare ourselves to be mothers. And just because we take away, just because I took away my children, I didn't suddenly not become a mother. I just became a mother of two dead children. And I think anybody that's thinking about having an abortion, think about the future and think about what the future really looks like. I can no longer have children. I'll never be a grandma. I'll never be a mother of children that are alive today. I will never have the pleasures that other people have had. In terms of just the Irish situation here at the moment, Rachel, you came to Ireland during the discussion, during the referendum debates. You stood on Grafton Street in Dublin and you told your story and it was so courageous. But some might look at that and say, but we lost, you know, what was the point? Yeah, I mean, we might have, won I mean, we might have lost the battle, but we haven't lost the war. You know, and we have to always keep that in mind. And we have to keep in mind that we need we need to wake up to the reality of what's happening. And it's like the whole world's gone to sleep and nobody's recognising that we're destroying human life um, and where choice needs to stop. Um, in Grafton Street, you see, I'm, 
I'm not called to change the hearts of every single person. I'm just called to do my part. And if we all just do our part and play the part we're meant to, then we will win and we are winning. How do you also, from my, from my faith background, you know, I know that one day Jesus is going to say to me, you know, what did you do for my little ones? What did you do? Yeah, and I have to stand up and say how I tried to protect the unborn. As you say, Rachel, everybody has a role to play. Looking to just the current situation in the UK at the moment, you know, there's a lot of talk about increasing numbers of abortions. And this devastating news now with these kind of DIY abortions taking place because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And already two women have lost their lives from taking these abortion pills at home. It must be very frustrating because the very same you know, activists who were using this as a reason, for example, to push our referendum through saying, you know, we can't have women taking these pills at home, are now saying it's okay, even with women losing their lives. Absolutely. It's, it's as if they've they've actually gone back and gone in towards, you know, the backstreet abortions that they never wanted, because this is just like backstreet abortions, no medical support. I mean, what are we doing for for the women that are being coerced or the sex trade or child abuse that won't be recognized or noticed when you're making a phone call and where's the medical intervention where are those two doctors who are meant to sign to say that this you know that this abortion is is allowed to carry on um that really concerns me and, and as bad as the counseling that you get in the abortion center that's non-existent through these phone calls and I'm actually having to pick up the pieces and I have a lot of people who are ringing me. And it's when I get really frustrated with abortion centres and I think if only they could listen to the screams and the horror that I have to hear from these women that took these abortion pills or, you know, went on to have surgical abortions. But the DIY abortions, we're in a completely new realm now. Um, and where's the positive side to that? Um, well, for me, you see, my abortions were surgical and as soon as they were done, they were over. But with the abortion pill, there is still hope because women can change their mind. And very often, you see, women will have surgical abortions and then suddenly go, what, what have I done? And it can be the same with taking an abortion pill. They take the first pill and they think, what have I done? Just in terms of on, on the theme of hope, is one of Britain's oldest abortion clinics recently shut its doors. Tell us a little bit about that and how you felt when that happened. Uh, well, that's actually, that was the Mary Stopes Calthorpe Centre in Birmingham. It was actually the abortion centre that I uh, was part of the campaign. So we would have 40 days out there twice a year. And it went on for decades that people would be praying there um, and just peacefully having a presence and openly helping people. Even if they'd had an abortion, we could help people with Rachel's Vineyard, but also, you know, giving people a proper choice. And, you know, we never thought that, you know, Calthorpe would ever close. And for me personally, how did I feel? Well, my children could rest in peace because my second abortion was at the Calthorpe Centre. How important is it, Rachel, for women to reach out to one another to share their stories and to to share that there is hope and healing after abortion absolutely it's so important um because with any grief um people have to work through grief and the problem with working through an abortion grief is that there's no body to bury and so the grief can seem as if it's going on and on and on and there's no end to it so through rachel's vineyard and other organizations as well that are out there we can support people to talk about and work through the different stages of grief. And there is hope and there is healing and there is a way forward after it. And part for me is my healing is, see, I can't keep Jude and Paul alive because I kill them. But in some respects, I keep them alive by keep doing the work that I'm doing, that I'm still talking about them. And, and I think that's so important. I think another area where we can talk about hope and healing is there is a lot of healing needed after the abortion referendum in Ireland. Um, but what are the causes for hope? What would be your advice to people watching today, Rachel, as where do we go from here? In, in relation to anybody that's had an abortion, reach out, 
there are people out there, loving people that want to help you, to help you move forward in respects to, you know, the hope for the future. Yes, this bill came in, but that bill can be quashed as well. And, you know, by loving people, by giving people the truth in a loving way and by being consistent with our truth, we will win because truth always wins with love. Well, what a fitting way to end our discussion today. Rachel, thank you so much for joining us at the Pro-Life Campaign Annual Conference 2020. No problem. Wow, it's incredible to watch someone like Rachel tell her story. What an amazing woman. We're going to keep things moving and hand back to Wendy again, where she'll be talking to Carla Lockhart, MP, the DUP representative from Northern Ireland, who's been working so hard to keep abortion out of Northern Ireland and has spoken eloquently in the House of Commons in the defence of life. And it's great to have with us now at the Pro-Life Campaign National Conference 2020, Carla Lockhart, MP. Carla, thank you so much for joining us at the conference today. I wanted to start off just by asking you about that speech in the House of Commons. It was so impressive because obviously you were being so brave and just highlighting the imposed regime from Westminster on Northern Ireland. But what motivated you in particular to put the protection of unborn life at the centre of your politics? Well, I suppose it's always been at the centre of my politics. It's a huge privilege, can I say, at the very start of this, to be a Member of Parliament. And it gives you the opportunity uh, to speak on behalf of others. And for me, there's none more important uh, than the most vulnerable and the unborn. And for me, it was a great opportunity. Uh, it, well, I believe nothing happens by chance. Uh, just a few weeks into my term in office, uh, the opportunity arose and I felt it was necessary that I uh, took it with, with both hands and ensured that I stood up for the dignity of life and for the most vulnerable in our society. I want a society in Northern Ireland that values life. I want to see services that will help women choose life. We want to see a perinatal palliative care centre, a maternal mental health unit and better childcare services. And that is my ask of this government. Help us create a culture of choosing life as opposed to killing an innocent little baby that does not have the voice to say, no mummy. And I suppose right from the beginning of my career in politics, I've always uh, noted the importance of upholding the value and worth of human life. And I believe that each and every human has an intrinsic dignity, which we sh should be protected in law and policy. So we're better than to do that than in the House of Parliament. What do you think is going to happen next? You still hold hope, Carla, that Northern Ireland, presumably through the Northern Ireland Assembly, will undo what has been imposed from Westminster with regard to abortion? Well, I suppose we were all very disappointed that Westminster did ride roughshod over the people of Northern Ireland. We sent a clear signal uh, within Parliament and also the people of Northern Ireland sent a clear signal with uh, the no a number of different initiatives to contact the government, uh, be it through petitions and uh, writing to their local MP. So we were very disappointed that the government did do this, but in many ways it didn't surprise us because there is such an agenda uh, to force this uh, upon people and make it more readily available. And obviously um, our UK government were not happy with the fact that Northern Ireland was still a life affirming uh, society. So they decided to, to ride roughshod and to introduce it. Uh, for me, the battle is not over. Uh, the battle has only begun. Uh, we do know that abortions are taking place in Northern Ireland. That saddens us greatly. Uh, we believe that there should be uh, services in place to try and encourage people not to choose to end life. We believe that there should be a value put on life and, and services to help those people who even have been told that there is no hope or that their child has a life limiting condition, there needs to be services in place uh, to help those people so that they can choose life. 
um, in relation to the, the legislative process and trying to get the law changed, I suppose we have to look at the makeup of the assembly. And I suppose it would be uh, unrealistic to say that we can do that and overturn the law completely. But I believe we have a real chance to make a real difference to the legislation. Our party's position has always been uh, to uh, uphold the value of life and to ensure that our law does. Uh, but unfortunately, not every party within a five party coalition government believes uh, that to be the case. Uh, so we will be introducing a bill to the Northern Ireland Assembly, a private members bill. My colleague, uh, Paul Given, will be introducing that to the Northern Ireland Assembly, which will allow for debate and discussion. And I firmly believe we will be able to peel back the draconian legislation that has been forced upon us. Carla, you're a young politician who speaks your mind and clearly has real backbone in terms of standing up for what you believe in. Um, it's a quality that isn't lauded enough nowadays. How important is it for people watching to be politically engaged and involved? Well, I think, I think there is a challenge to us all and I take this challenge myself. You know, legislation is one thing, but actually creating a society where uh, they choose life is so important to me. So I'm lobbying for uh, changes to the services that we have in place. So I firmly believe we need a perinatal palliative care hospice in Northern Ireland, and we need a sanctuary where women who um, find themselves uh, pregnant and not knowing what way to turn, I believe we need a sanctuary for them to, to feel uh, that they can go and, and to feel valued. So there's lots of things that we can do uh, within uh, Northern Ireland to ensure that we do still uh, have those, uh, that life affirming law, or not law, but life affirming. And so you're, you're in a great position, Carly, you know, as elected representative to do that. What sort of an impact does it have and how important is it for people to contact their local representatives and say things like, you know, we need a palliative care, for example, for babies in Northern Ireland. How important is that? I think it's really important. Um, I think at the end of the day, we are the people who will make the decision with regards to funding such initiatives. So absolutely contact your elected representatives. And look, every election brings an opportunity. And I firmly believe that in the next election, the pro-life movement from right across all communities needs to send a clear signal by electing politicians who are pro-life and that can and will uh, change the law, uh, having them elected to the Northern Ireland Assembly or to Westminster. It's important that that, that message gets out there. So what's going to be your focus now in terms of your priorities as a Member of Parliament in the near future? Well, it will always be about life. Um, and, you know, there's lots of uh, outworkings from that as well. We know that the next battle will be end of life and the desire from so many to now end life prematurely and to take it into their own hands. Um, again, as I say, I believe in the sanctity of life. And I think it's so important that we have as many people speaking up and speaking out against these uh, barbaric laws. I think as well, we need to really look and, and try and refocus society. We're so focused on the you know, protection of whales, dogs, cats, you know, different types of animals. And yet we're prepared to allow a baby to be aborted in the womb, ripped limb by limb in the womb. It just, it doesn't stack up. So we need to really get into the hearts and minds of people again and, and start to uh, really make them think about the value of life. And also I think we need to use science as well. We know that a baby or that a fetus uh, feels pain at 18 weeks, that has been proven. We need to start to show that and we need to start to use examples. I've worked with Heidi Crowder, uh, an amazing Down syndrome campaigner, 
And, you know, it's using examples to actually say, you know, what we're allowing inside the womb, we wouldn't allow outside it, it would be disability discrimination. So there's lots of ways that we can really start to challenge this law and start to really get into the hearts and minds of people. Finally, just to ask you, Carla, is one of the ways that we need to be thinking about that is trying to get people to work together because however a person feels on abortion, surely the idea, for example, now when we think of the abortion law here in Ireland, that we've had 7,000 abortions, one is too many, but surely we can work together and say, well, how can we bring that number down? Absolutely. I think uh, the strength of the pro-life lobby is it's diverse. Um people and the diverse people that have got involved in it. I have stood on a stage with political opponents um, championing uh, life and championing the pro-life cause. Um, you know, I always make the example that I've stood on a stage with um, Anne Brawley, who was a Sinn Féin MLA councillor. And, you know, Anne and I do not agree politically and we don't agree, you know, on political ideology but we're both uh, ardent pro-life camp. And I will stand with anyone who will take their stand for, for life and for uh, trying to change our abortion laws. Well, Carla, thank you so much for joining us on the Pro-Life Campaign Conference today. Thank you. It's so reassuring to know that there's politicians out there like Carla who are working so hard in defence of life. Fair play to her for her courage and conviction. We're going to keep things moving again. Wendy Grace has been kept really busy with all of these interviews. And next she's going to be interviewing Katie Fenton from the wonderful group Students for Life. Then she'll be interviewing members of the Oireachtas. After that, we'll change tack for a while. But first, we're going to get an update on what's been happening at present in Students for Life. We've heard from so many of the speakers today how important it is that we communicate the pro-life message on college campuses. But how can we do it at the moment here in Ireland, given the COVID-19 restrictions? And how effective are we at getting across the pro-life message on college campuses where we might often feel like we're in the minority? Well, joined with us at our conference today to tell us a little bit about the work of Students for Life and to give us examples and ideas of how we can get involved, we have Katie Fenton with us. Katie, thanks for joining us. Thanks for inviting me on. So tell us a little bit about the work that Students for Life does. Yes, so Students for Life are a national um, group. We support uh, pro-life students on campuses nationwide. Uh, we're made up of students and we are really there just to help them spread the, the pro-life message, the, the life message on, on campuses. And one of the things that's been really encouraging and people should definitely check out the Students for Life Facebook is just seeing these really positive but intelligent pro-life posts coming from students just sharing their stories of well this is why i'm pro-life how important is it that we engage on social media oh it's it's massive it always has been but obviously since march we've all seen the um the impact that social media has to have on our lives now going forward um students email us with their own personal stories and their own blogs and we're always i suppose overwhelmed by their own um astute um, you know, individual stories that they tell us, um, how they see th how important this human rights um, argument and, and message is. Uh, we're always looking for new um, blog posts on this matter. So I'm going to do a shout out to anyone who feels they have something to share. Please do email us in your, your own stories on this because it, people need to hear it. It's encouraging to read these stories online. One of the things, Katie, of course, at the moment is, and as you've touched on, is because of the COVID-19 restrictions, I'm sure it's hard to do some of the work that you usually would be doing. But what are some of the things that Students for Life are working on at the moment? Yeah, so obviously things have been a lot different since March and we're kind of raring to get back to that level of personal connection that we had before. Um, luckily, in January 2020, we had a fantastic uh, student training weekend where there was uh, nearly 40 students um, from Friday to Sunday. We had amazing speakers, team building, and 
that we gathered a lot of momentum that weekend and it kept us going for the last few months. Um, albeit we don't know when the next time we'll see each other face to face is since then we have run um, a series of online videos called the Outlook. They're on our Facebook page. They still are, so please check them out where students interviewed people of pro-life interests. We had a pro-life doctor, um, people who had their own pro-life experiences within their family, students. They were really popular and they reached out to a lot of people who may not have heard of us before then. We hope uh, to do some online training over the next few months and then fingers crossed in 2021 we'll see each other face to face again. It's really uplifting, Katie, just to hear of those 40 students from different colleges across the country who are so motivated and so energized. But of course, the media often likes to depict that there's no young people involved and you know that to be totally false. But when young people who are on campuses feel like a minority or feel like everybody is against them, what's the best way that they can challenge that and also stay motivated and encouraged and realize that they are making a difference? Yeah, I think, yeah, there's no doubt, right? You know, the students, that demographic are a minority in that viewpoint. However, um, those who hold it, like they stick together like glue. And that's the big thing. If there's someone watching this that isn't connected with other pro-life students, uh, maybe a recent graduate who isn't, please email us at hello at studentsforlife.e because we can put you in touch with that support group that you need. You know, college is that opportunity where uh, you have more free time than ever before. Um, you can, you know, I know it's different now, but in reality, you can attend talks, you can do stuff that you won't be able to do when you're working. Um, and these students are the future policymakers, future lawmakers, doctors, um, parents. And, you know, while we might be small in numbers, we can still have a huge impact and we still do have a huge impact. You know, there's some medical students um, who are part of our, um, our group and, you know, they, I suppose, come up against challenges within their um, lectures. But if they have the right resources, they can feel encouraged, you know, encouraged to um, speak the truth on this matter within their, in their college uh, setting. So from the Students for Life perspective, Katie, what is the best way at the moment that people can get involved, whether they're students or whether they're people who have long graduated college like me, but they still want to support your work or get involved in some way? Yes, yeah, so right now, if you're watching at home, please go to our website, www.studentsforlife.ie. We have a sign up sheet on that. Um, we like to stay connected, obviously, with students, but if you're a recent graduate, please sign up. We have to stay connected in this digital age. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. And then what we really would love is, you know, we're look, always looking for student contributors, you know, to our blog, to our future video series, or perhaps you have skills that we don't even know we, we're missing, you know, that you feel that you can help us out with. Our email is hello at studentsforlife.ie. Um, so thanks so much for having us on today, Wendy. Well, Katie, thank you so much for chatting to us and for all the work that Students for Life is doing. And of course, from everybody watching, I know they'll want to wish you well as you're due your second baby in December. So we'll be wishing you well for that. Thanks, Wendy. And as Katie mentioned there, the Students for Life website, and you can see the details on your screen as to how you can get connected with them and sign up to all their updates, or perhaps there's another way that you can share your gifts or talents with them. Thank you so much, Katie and Wendy, for that amazing update. Again, if you'd like to find out more about Students for Life Ireland, please visit studentsforlife.ie. Now, I'm delighted to report that we have close to 1,000 people tuning in from all over the country and the world um, across all the different social media platforms. And lots of you have been sending in your comments, so I thought I'd read out some of, you, some of your comments here now. Andy Hink from Cork says, glad to see that there's a huge spotlight in the increase in abortion numbers. Public are totally unaware of this awful tragedy. Keep on spreading the word. Never give up. Best of luck with today's conference. Thank you so much, Anne. And then Paul Duffy from Inchicore says, a big thank you to Rachel McKenzie for having the courage to share her story. She's spot on about everyone needing to play their part in the debate. Every sincere effort is worthwhile, even if we don't see the results straight away. Paul, I couldn't agree with you more, definitely. 
And then we have Mary in Sligo saying, the definition of hope is seen in abortion clinic clothes. Thank you so much, Rachel. Finally, Susan Horn from Wicklow says, never heard Carla Lockhart speak before. What a star she is, a truly amazing lady. Susan, you're spot on there. I couldn't agree with you more on that. Now we're going to move on and for the, I'm going to hand you over to Wendy Grace for the first of two interviews with Pro-Life Iraqis members. And I'm delighted now to welcome Deputy Carol Nolan and Independent Senator Ronan Mullen. Thanks for joining us at the Pro-Life Campaign's National Conference today. Carol, if I could start with you, you have asked some really excellent parliamentary questions this year, especially in relation to the government's telemedicine home abortion regime. Of course, that was introduced since the COVID-19 pandemic struck. It's very frustrating to, to see that your voice probably isn't being listened to enough. But is the government mm. listening to people who've been trying to point this out individually? Because this is a really dangerous policy, isn't it? It is. It's very dangerous and indeed very concerning. And when we think back to two years ago, I mean, we had Leo Baralker coming out against DIY abortions, uh, Michal Martin also, and Simon Harris. But now they seem to be quite happy to, to let it roll the way it is. Um, I'm very, very concerned. I, I believe that it, it's, it's, it is of concern and it, it is worrying too that the National Healthcare Reporting, which the HSC does every year, the HSC reports on many, many health issues such as hip operations, levels of immunizations and, and so forth, heart failure and all of all of everything that affects people in, in regard to health. But it does not report on the adverse outcomes of, of telemedicine and indeed of, of abortion medication. And that is of great concern to many of us in, in the pro-life movement and has been highlighted too that you know two women have lost their lives. Um, through the use of, of unsupervised abortion pills. And what we need here is we need the minister to take note. It's uh, very hypocritical of, of him and indeed of many members of government who use this as a platform to uh, to get compassion for women, as they said at the time, and to, to more or less uh, make a platform for abortion and to try and justify abortion. And, and indeed, that's, that's what they would have used as, as a platform and misleading people. But it is it is very concerning. And I know a number of doctors have also raised the issue. And I will keep, as I say, keep um, continuing with my questioning of the minister and keep challenging this issue because women and their unborn babies deserve much, much better. We know that. And I mean, this is endangering many women. And unfortunately, I think it's not until something happens. Um, that notice and correct notice will be taken of this. But in the meantime, I know myself and many other pro-life politicians will continue to challenge and question the minister on this very issue. And it's sad, as you say, Deputy Nolan, that, you know, do we have to wait for a tragedy to happen? And people have, of course, been trying to highlight the fact that two women's lives have already been lost to these DIY abortions. I mean, the, the fact that... Um, a woman could, for example, have an ectopic pregnancy and take one of these pills. It could be extremely dangerous. I, a question to you both then on that, because I know many people watching today, for example, might have sent um, e-cards to their TDs trying to highlight this issue. How important is it and does it make a difference when people pick up the phone and they call the local office of a TD or a senator and tell them about an issue and say, I have a problem with this and here's what you need to know. Does it work? I think it does, and I, it provided it's done the right way, it's absolutely vital. I and mean, I think as Carol has just explained there, thanks to her great work, we're, we're discovering just how reckless politicians can be. Uh, they don't mind endangering uh, public health, even the basic safeguards from the point of view of a woman's welfare, uh, quite apart from protection of the unborn, would, 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 would surely raise massive warning signals about this telemedicine approach to abortion. But when they think there's going to be cover from the political establishment and from the media, they're just, they're just happy to go with the flow. I mean, the only thing that can change that is if people are lobbying politicians hard, but in the right way, to persuade them that this is irresponsible and it has to change. One of the other things that's so important as well as political engagement is really trying to connect up with practical supports for women who experience an unplanned pregnancy. But there is a difficulty that when it feels like when you're trying to highlight some of these supports or get involved in them, 
the media pounce on any hint of anything that's trying to say, let women know about supports that exist out there uh, and, and paints them and vilifies them. And that makes it really difficult. How do we manage that and challenge it and make sure that we are still able to be able to put out as many pro-life supports as we can for women? But it, I don't know if Carl wants to. Address. Yeah, well, well, that's very true. And I do want to welcome the fact that a link centre by Gianna Care was recently set up in, in Offaly. And there are so many great centres throughout this state that are helping women. And indeed, yes, of course, it's it's swimming against the tide. But look at what's, what's legal, as we know, isn't always right. And here is a case of something that just is not right, that takes away the fundamental right to life of the child and endangers a mother so i mean we have every right um to go out there and indeed you know every right to encourage women and other people involved to you know do their best and absolutely advertise the supports available and yes of course we're going to get backlash but look at that's no different to to the referendum time which was a very very vicious campaign and indeed lots of character assassinations uh, took place on people but it's something that we need to be strong on and i think we need to continue with good work because lives are being saved by those very supports and we need to ensure that every life we can save is saved and that women know about these supports and don't feel that abortion is their only option. And I mean, that's been articulated through government and through the HSC that it is their only option. There's no mention of adoption or anything else or indeed support services. So I suppose it's up to us as a movement and indeed the great volunteers that we have on the ground who are doing fantastic work and need to be commended in that. And, um, you know, they need to keep continuing to do what they do and need to stay strong in doing so because they're doing fantastic work. Finally, just to kind of build on what Deputy Nolan is saying there, Senator Mullen, um, trying to try and create a more of an appetite within government, because whatever political party, whatever position they take on the abortion issue, surely the reality that, sadly, the abortion rate has increased exponentially since this legisl legislation was passed. It is 7,000 too many. How can we make more of a desire, more of a will from government to say, OK, the number has grown. How can we reduce it and put practical supports in place? Well, we have to recognise where we're at, Wendy, which is that they've abandoned the notion of quality counselling. Abortion is seen as a service. They don't have an inner hope, much less an expressed hope that women would, would, would choose positive alternatives. And when you look at what the government are willing to fund, it is only those counselling modes that, that really funnel women towards abortion. And anything else that might offer in a positive way, truthful, non-coercive, but quality information, offering women real hope. When you hear the stories of people who say, you know, I would have chosen not to have an abortion if, if only there was somebody else there to, to, who could say to me, I can cope, and you, you can cope and we will help you. Uh, I think we, for the future, what we don't want from the government is funding. That's not going to be forthcoming for the foreseeable future. But what we must insist on is the freedom the freedom to provide uh, quality counselling options. And we have to be at our best. That is going to involve input from the medical profession. It's going to involve, as I said, offering truthful, non-coercive, but positive information where there is real reassurance and support on offer. And there are examples of that being done in other countries, which we can probably do more to liaise with. So the, when, when, when people do start mislabeling what we do as rogue agencies because that's the smear they love to put out there because it suggests that there's something damaging and wrong being done when in reality pro-life counseling is the only quality counseling here because it actually tells the truth but in a deeply respectful way to women it recognizes that they have legal freedom as things stand to have abortions but by offering uh not just the practical information that can help them make a better choice, but also the hope of real personal support. That's when we're going to see change and that's what we have to work to now. Well, thank you, Senator Ronan Mullen and Deputy Carol Nolan for joining us at the Pro-Life Campaign Conference today. And thank you for your ongoing hard work as well. so nice to see some of our elected representative to get representatives together speaking up for life. We really need to support and encourage them at every turn. 
People like Carol and Ronan are genuine pro-life heroes. I would like to encourage people to keep sending in their comments on the social media. Like I said, you're just as much part of this conference as anyone else. I'm going to go back again to a few more of, of your comments here. Um, Gina McGovern in Mayo says, lovely to hear Cara Nolan TD. She is one she is one special person. If every constituency had a representative in the Dáil like her, Ireland would be a very different country. Thanks to Senator Ronan Mullen for always stepping forward and staying, and staying positive. We are blessed to have both of you elected in office. Absolutely, Gina, I couldn't agree more. Then Patrick in Donegal says, thank you, Carol Nolan, your words, just becoming something, just because something is legal does not make it, make it ethically right, resonates with me and many, and that's Patrick in Donegal. Thank you so much, guys, for sending in your comments. Really, you do make this conference. This conference is for you guys, and we want you to be just as much a part of it and have your voices heard. Next up, we're going to uh, return to Students for Life. A group of young people have been really busy um, producing themed videos on various aspects of the pro-life issue. We're going to play a rough cut of one of these videos now and then have a quick talk afterwards with some of the students that have been involved in the project. The writer Mark Twain is reputed to have said, it's easier to fool people than to convince them that they've been fooled. As someone who was almost aborted 22 years ago, I identify with this quote in the context of the Irish abortion debate. Before the repeal of the Eighth Amendment in 2018, you had politicians like Michal Martin, Simon Harris, Leo Varadkar and Mary Lou MacDonald. And they all went to unbelievable lengths to convince voters that abortion would be restrictive and rare if they voted for repeal. Yet within only one year of the new abortion law coming into effect, the official figures show that abortions have increased by over 60%, even when you factor in the illegal abortion pills sold online before the law changed. So to put this into perspective, in 2018, there were 2,879 abortions. In 2019, after appeal, that figure rose to over 7,000. No voter wanted this, and our political leaders told us that it wouldn't happen. In fact, people like myself were accused of scaremongering when we said it would happen. When you're forced to come to terms with the fact that your life was almost extinguished by abortion, I can assure you, the right to choose takes on a very, very different meaning to the glowing way it is venerated in and by the media. I found it very sad watching abortion supporters on Twitter recently celebrating the huge increase in the number of abortions, just like the way they cheered for abortion in Dublin Castle when the referendum results were announced. But perhaps what disturbed me most of all was the fact that you had abortion supporters on Twitter referring to these tragic cases as small victories. These were 7,000 unborn babies that had their lives ended, not 7,000 small victories, as some have suggested. It's hard to believe that people would cheer for a law that doesn't even provide for pain relief to be given to an unborn baby prior to a late-term abortion, or for a baby born alive after a botched abortion to be comforted and not left to die alone without any medical care. But this is the sad, sad reality of where things are at. Ireland now has one of the most extreme and inhumane abortion laws anywhere in the world. Another example of the extremity of our abortion law is the fact that not one, but three different sections of the bill technically allows for abortion up to birth. There are absolutely no time restrictions or gestational limits on abortion in sections nine through 11. Now look, don't take my word for it. Check out the facts for yourself but we do need to start questioning this new law and the way that it has been rolled out. It's the only way to stop the devastation of abortion and the spiraling increase in the number of abortions that has already taken hold. Hi, Gavin and Mary. Thank you so, so much for joining us. I, I'll start with you, Gavin. Can you please walk us through this project, the purpose of it, uh, and why you're making these videos, why you think it's so important? Yeah, sure. So, um, hi, Christina. Uh, this, that's actually the first time that uh, I've seen the video myself. Uh, it's, it's a rough cut, and you know, with a few more tweaks, uh, it'll be out there on social media very soon, I hope. 
Um, so that was kind of an exclusive screening that, that we just watched. Um, I suppose the purpose of, uh, of putting together a series like this is to help counter the misinformation that existed uh, in 2018 during the referendum and uh, that frankly still exists today. Um, it's, it's really hard to try and break through kind of the media bias, uh, you know, but we have to keep trying and we have to keep honing how we get our, our message out there. Uh, of particular concern to me, I suppose, uh, and it was touched on a little earlier, is the fact that, you know, a woman contemplating an, abor an, an abortion uh, doesn't automatically hear about positive alternatives uh, to abortion if they get in touch with uh, the state-funded counselling agencies. And to me, that's, you know, it's it's an absolute scandal. It's, it's a disgrace and it has to change. Um, part of the motivation behind the video you just saw uh, was to raise awareness on on that very point. Now, <laughs> a lot of you are probably thinking, oh God, here's that Gavin Chop again, uh, talking about the same stuff in, in yet another video. Uh, and, you know, I agree to some extent, it is a bit repetitious. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, aside from various fantastic politicians um, who will bring it up in the Dáil or, or in the Shannon, uh, we really are the only output for this kind of, of information. Uh, and I mean, to kind of solidify my point, I suppose, uh, the vast majority of my friends, for example, would be pro-choice. And, you know, I really do mean this when I say it, that not a single one of them knew anything about the legislation or any of the facts mentioned uh, about prior or post referendum. Uh, you know, so this is why it's so vital that we keep on doing this and getting our message out there, because as we know, uh, abortion is perhaps single-handedly uh, the greatest human rights abuse of, of our time. Great stuff, Gavin, and thank you. That message, I think, definitely does come across in that video. Una Mary, yeah. I'll, I'll come to you now. Um, am I right in saying you are involved in making a video about how the current abortion legislation does not uh, ensure that uh, unborn babies will receive, um, receive uh, pain relief in late-term abortions? Thank you, Christina. Yes, I'm involved at the minute with producing a short video on that particularly horrifying aspect of the new law. I mean, most people are just unaware of how truly horrific and barbaric the new law is, that it doesn't even afford a morsel of respect for the unborn baby. And at the very least, guarantee that the baby feels, you know, no pain when an, when an abortion is taking place. And everyone in Ireland needs to know that. And so I hope that the video I'm helping to produce will contribute to informing the people about this awful reality. Thank you so much, guys. It's so encouraging to hear what you guys are doing. And I know some of your friends as well are working on other videos that about different aspects of the pro-life issues. So thank you so, so much for your work. It's so encouraging to see. see. Thanks. Thank you, Christina. We're now going to take a short break. You've all earned it, very much so. We will show a nice slideshow during the break and you can go get yourself a cup of tea, uh, fill up your coffee, and we'll be back here right, get, right again in five minutes for one of today's highlights. Don't go right back or you'll miss it.
Hello everybody, welcome back uh, to the Pro-Life National Conference 2020. I know that was a brief break. I hope that you got time to put on the kettle and make yourself a cup of tea, hot chocolate or a coffee and that you're ready for the second half of the conference. Um, I've really enjoyed it so far and I'm, I know that so many of you are watching. If you've just clicked in and you've just joined us, you're very welcome. You haven't missed too much, don't worry. Um, you have loads more left to come. So I'm just going to check in with the social media comments. I know Christina did a small bit there, but I know some people probably had more time during the break to uh, comment. So um, from Johnny on YouTube, bravest students in Ireland. Well done, you guys. Fantastic work and courage. Students for Life do such amazing work. I completely agree with you, Johnny. They are doing revolutionary things. And if you are interested, um, studentsforlife.ie is their website and they also have Facebook groups for different colleges and universities if you're a student, pro-life student starting university soon. Uh, another one, Bernard in Kildare. So interesting to hear Carla speak about working with people across the divide. We all need to learn to talk to people who disagree with our opinion. Definitely agree with you. I think that's such an important skill to be able to have with this debate, um, especially when keeping our calm and getting our message across properly. Uh, Gabriel in Mayo says, grateful to be tuning into my first pro-life conference. You are so welcome, Gabriel. It's so good to have you. And uh, the last one, Anne McHugh. Thank you, Ronan and Carol. They do amazing work. Brilliant. Okay, so I'm so excited just to carry on with the programme. The next interview that we have, I'm really excited for you to watch it. Um, it's with one of the most creative and inspirational pro-life leaders in the world. So here is Ryan Bomberger. I am out of an international and all named book, Not Equal, Civil Rights Gone Wrong. He is also one of the most prominent pro-life voices in the United States and through his highly effective advertising campaigns, he's prompted a national debate on the very disproportionate concentration of abortion clinics in black communities in the US. Ryan has an incredible personal story. His biological mother was raped but gave birth to her son. He movingly thanks his birth mother for the gift of life. Ryan was adopted as a baby and grew up in a loving, multiracial family in Pennsylvania. In addition to his many other achievements, he is the co-founder of the RadianceFoundation.org, a life-affirming organization based on the belief that every human life has an intrinsic and unique purpose. So it's great now to be joined virtually by Ryan Bomberger. Ryan, thank you so much for joining us at the Pro-Life Campaign National Conference today. Virtually, I mean, it was great to have met you back in 2011 when you addressed us in person. Yes, that was a few years ago. <laughs> of course, since then, Ryan, a lot has changed in Ireland and so many people watching today will be feeling very deflated by the fact that we lost the referendum that abortion is now very much a reality in Ireland. Um, in terms of your own experience and the experience of the United States, where you have been constantly working on that effort to row back on the abortion reality in your country, what are some of the grassroots initiatives that have worked and also the things that haven't worked that we can be thinking about here in Ireland? Right. Well, first of all, the repeal of the Eighth Amendment was such, such a tragedy. And so much of it was bolstered by America's big tech companies and our mainstream media that aided and embedded the effort. So that was that was a tragedy. But with every fight for justice, um, it's always a multifaceted approach. And the grassroots stuff is so crucial and so important. And we can't overlook it as someone who crafts messaging all the time. And I'm always excited to figure out what messaging resonates with people, what messaging breaks through to people. And that's a huge part of this because we're countering messaging where we are being bombarded by, by mainstream media, we're being bombarded by all kinds of institutions that are distorting the issue of abortion. And our messaging is crucial. As someone who speaks on college campuses, for instance, one of the grassroots things that we do is we speak to students who always get this singular, radically pro-abortion perspective. And it's really an amazing thing to be able to break through on these college campuses. As a college lecturer, you know, I, I, I spend a lot of time, extensive research and creative multimedia presentations. It's amazing because students who come in with all kinds of hostility toward me, there are, there are some at the end who have a radically different view because they never heard that perspective. So that's part of the grassroots. 
the sidewalk counseling is part of the grassroots, the, the 40 days for life type of things that are happening, the pregnancy centers. I mean, that's grassroots stuff right there that changes things, that changes lives. They show how much they love the mother and they love the child and they care for them. Uh, another grassroots thing, and for me, the most foundational grassroots thing is family. You, you can't have grassroots if you're not training up your child. In fact, I'm just going to do this little plug here for my wife, who's my, my favorite person, the co-founder of the Radiance Foundation. But she created this incredible uh, illustrated children's book called Pro-Life Kids. Kids are naturally pro-life. They actually have to be taught that it's okay to harm another human being. So when we talk about grassroots, you teach children who are naturally pro-life, you reinforce what is already there. We have to teach our children for a broken world reaches them. And so things like this, pro-life kids, like this, this says it doesn't matter your size or your age, you have equal value, whatever the stage. When that is instilled in a child, we don't have to work so hard to deprogram and change the mind of an adult. And in so many ways, Ryan, like it's really interesting just in terms of having such a, a positive resource to share with children. But in many ways, is it almost that we need to take it back to those basic arguments and discussions, even when you're talking about college campuses and when we're thinking about trying to win hearts and minds, especially in those right. environments, like as you've mentioned, where they're hostile and you're expecting to be kind of beaten down. And I think there's a big fear around that in Ireland at the moment. And there's still a lot of woundedness post-referendum because yes. people did receive so much abuse in person and online. How do we combat that? And how do we let that wound heal while making sure our com communication is still one that's focusing on winning hearts and minds? I think one of the first things we have to do is understand that we have to have a tough exterior. Yes, we are human beings and we do internalize a lot of this stuff. But quite honestly, when you fight for justice, there's going to be a lot of hate and venom against you. It's just the norm. And so we have to be able to kind of, in a way, get past a lot of that hurt because one, we have to understand where that hurt is coming from. Hurt comes from the broken. And so we can't respond ever in kind to that. Um, we respond with kindness to that. But you look at slavery abolitionists. They were hated. I mean, you're talking about people who risk their very lives to set others free. So in this fight, there is going to be all kinds of animosity, all kinds of venom. And we have to be able to kind of move past some of that to understand here is the real issue. And I have to keep going because my pursuit cannot end because justice calls for that. Ryan, I think one of the things that is so powerful about the work that you do is that you share your own personal story. And that's one of the questions I remember in, in the video that we showed at the 2011 conference where it's sharing a bit of your personal story. And it's that question that is a child ever unwanted? How do we make that hit home with people? You know, there's really no such thing as unwanted. I mean, that's the excuse. Anytime we can dehumanize a human being, it justifies any violence or discrimination that follows. And so when we say even the phrase unwanted child, what does that mean? Some of us may have been unwanted by a biological parent or parents, but we're all wanted by someone. And in my family, my small family of 15, I have six brothers, six sisters, and 10 of us were adopted. We were all wanted and loved. And so I just dismiss that whole myth of the unwanted child that somehow justifies an industry that destroys life that is that its worth is somehow based on wantedness. Tell us a little bit more, just you've, you've given us a bit of a flavor of your story, Ryan, but for those who haven't heard us, share a little bit more of your personal story. Well, growing up in my, my tiny little family, 15, in uh, Pennsylvania, on a farm, uh, growing up in that situation with 10 adopted kids, my parents had three uh, homemade kids first, I guess you want to call them the original Bomberger kids, and then adopted 10. It was awesome. It was, you know, a family of, of 13 kids, 10 adopted, but not just adopted, adopted and loved. Many of us have stories that the world would say, you know, we should have been aborted. But my parents believed that every one of our lives had purpose. And so here we have a family of, of white and black and biracial, I put that in quotes because we're all just one human race. You know, Native American, Vietnamese, um, some with physical disabilities, some with learning disabilities. Every single one of us loved like crazy and we had adoption unleash purpose in our lives by two parents who just defied the world's low expectations. You know, sometimes people think, it had to be crazy growing up with a family of 15. Sometimes it was. And I don't want to typify the adoption experience as it was just all easy and joy and rainbows. 
adoption happens because of brokenness and in the natural and the supernatural, it brings restoration, it brings wholeness and healing. And that was our journey. And so here I, I'm that fringe example. I'm that 1% that's used 100% of the time to justify abortion. My birth mom experienced the horror and the violence of rape, but courageously not only gave me the incredible gift of, ag- of adoption, she gave me to, my, to the family that loved me and, and helped unleash my destiny. And so I, I can't help but think that the circumstances of our conception never do of our worth. So that's why I will always fight for the most marginalized. I will always fight for those who are the most defenseless and the most vulnerable. How does it feel, Ryan, when your situation, you know, is used to push forward an abortion agenda where basically the message is um, you, you shouldn't exist? You know, I, it's, it's hard when your story, which is, is rooted in tragedy, is in further exploited. But see, that's what the abortion industry does. It's always about exploitation and manipulation. And what they don't want to hear is the other side of the story. They don't want to hear the strength of birth moms. They want to hear the adoptee whose life defies that lie of the unwanted child. And here I am, a uh, happily married father of four. Two of my kiddos are also adopted and they are, they are loved like crazy. All four of my kids are, are, are loved like crazy. Out of the four, three were unplanned, which really means nothing. Most of life is unplanned. And the way that you approach unplanned situations, you approach it with the most life-affirming, loving sort of approach. They, all these issues are solvable, but the other side doesn't want to hear these stories where triumph rises from tragedy. And I love the fact that my life is, is a testament to that. And there are millions and millions of others whose lives are testaments to that truth as well. In many ways, Ryan, the work that the Radiance Foundation has done was the, the original and the authentic Black Lives Matter movement, because you have been trying to highlight how abortion disproportionately impacts black neighborhoods. Tell us a little bit about that and this, the stats there and what we know. So true. We were extolling the, the fact that Black Lives Matter long before the hashtag movement, long before the radically pro-abortion hashtag movement. In fact, I deal with a lot of this, this in my book called Not Equal, Civil Rights Gone Wrong, which is available on Apple iBooks. I explore all of this. In fact, the thing is, I didn't know any of this 10 years ago. I had to be proactive. I had to be intentional about learning about this. But when you talk about abortion in the black community, it's the number one killer in the black community. It outnumbers the top 15 causes of death combined. 79% of surgical abortion facilities are located in predominantly minority neighborhoods. This is by design. This is, this is by historical design. It's why abortion rates are up to five times higher in the black community than the majority population. In fact, the city that spawned Planned Parenthood, the leading killer of black lives, there are more black babies aborted than born alive. So for every 1,000 born alive, Wendy, every 1,033 black babies are aborted. It is the only demographic in America where there are more induced deaths than births. And as I mentioned, this is by historical design. So when you have a, a Black Lives Matter movement that's you know, chanting and exclaiming the, the refrain, Black Lives Matter, well, which black lives matter? Because if they all don't matter, then black lives don't matter. And this is what they prove over and over again, especially as they stand in solidarity. They announce solidarity with the abortion industry. They announce solidarity with Planned Parenthood. They partner with Planned Parenthood that kills 360 black lives every single day here in America. And so what we do through the Radiance Foundation is we've been exposing that. We launch billboard campaigns to expose the history of the American eugenics movement, to talk about Planned Parenthood's DNA, their racist DNA, which has never changed. In fact, just recently, this summer, One of the largest affiliates of Planned Parenthood in New York, it's called Planned Parenthood of Greater New York, admitted online, because they were trying to have their CEO fired, they said their CEO was racist, and they said, this is verbatim, Planned Parenthood was founded by a racist white woman. That's a part of history that cannot be changed, end quote. And the insane thing is they don't see the very racism that is being carried out in all the fatalities through abortion that are disproportionately targeted in the black community. So this is what we've been exposing. We continue to expose. People want to talk about systemic racism. Planned Parenthood, the abortion industry here in the United States is the very definition of systemic racism. How do we, because it's so frustrating, Ryan, when you hear the statistics that are there plain to see that this systemic racism that you start about, unfortunately, it starts in the womb. You know, it starts before the child is even born. 
But how do we get this across to those who are kind of jumping on board these kind of populist movements and say, hang on, let's expose your hypocrisy here. But right. in a way, that's also trying to win hearts and minds at the same time. Right. It, it, it's not an it's not an easy task at all. One, when you when you're talking about people who are so emotionally tied to a lie, that's a hard bond to break. And yet it's one that we have to continue to relentlessly try to break and peacefully. You know, as a creative, I'm always trying to figure out how do I illuminate this in a way that someone will see this differently? And we see progress. And it's not the seismic sort of change that I know a lot of people wish, you know, in movements. They 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 love these massive changes, but sometimes it is just a one-on-one -on -one heart change. Sometimes it is just the small conversation. Sometimes it is in your church, in your workplace, in your, your home, in your school, and it's one-on-one -on -one conversations. But the thing is, as pro-lifers, we cannot fear engaging in these tough conversations. And more importantly, we have to ourselves be equipped and educated so we even know where to go in these conversations. But a large part of this is the fear of engaging, the fear of offense and the fear of what the response will be. But we can't because we have to focus on the joy, actually, of liberation, of freeing people from these lies that are, it's not just a simple issue of something that is a, a mental stronghold, but we're talking about actual deaths, whether in Ireland, you're talking about, if I believe the numbers are on 7,000, that's 7,000 too many. In the United States, we're talking like 860 plus thousand each year in the United States. Every single life lost is tragic. And we have the power to engage and to shift things even in an incremental way. And we, and we have to do it. And Ryan, just speaking of those numbers, which are so devastating. And as you mentioned, just the numbers here in Ireland, I mean, since the referendum in 2018, those figures, those lives, those lives lost have increased by 60%. What are some initiatives that you have seen that have been effective at reducing the numbers of abortions that have been taking place? Well, of course, legislatively, that's always going to happen because this fight is, is always that multifaceted fight. We cannot, you know, ignore the fact that these, the things that we do have to happen concurrently. But beside the le besides the legislative part, there's the, the, the spiritual, the moral, the material, the cultural part. That's why, for instance, pregnancy centers here in the United States, we have 2,700 pregnancy centers. They are a huge part of why abortion numbers are coming down. They're a huge part of people understanding what it means to actually act in compassion. It's not that, that anyone ignores any of the circumstances that lead to abortion. These centers are the ones who are actually dealing with that. And so that's a huge part for me. That's why our the Ratings Foundation helps to raise millions for pregnancy centers because they are on the front lines. Um, the sidewalk counseling, and I know that here and abroad, that so many forces are trying to shut down the voice of, of compassion outside of these abortion facilities. And there's a reason for that. They understand that they have to silence you. That's the way that they, they can continue the lie and to continue the propaganda. But those peaceful disruptions, and that's what we need to do, peaceful disruptions, sidewalk counseling, get conversations started in your churches, Get stuck conversations started in your schools. The students here in America, like with Students for Life of America, it's been amazing to see Gen Zers who are on the front lines of, of, of speaking a pro-life worldview, of carrying that out from coast to coast. And so our colleges, our high schools are pivotal in, in having young people understand what it truly means to be pro-life. So it's that kind of, those kinds of efforts that are succeeding. That's why what we're seeing in the polls, we should be outnumbered even far greater than we are. We're outspent billions to one, literally. We're, we're, we have every institution against us. You're talking about mainstream media, you're talking about academia, you're talking about Hollywood and entertainment, the political system, so much is against us. It doesn't make any sense that we're still holding on and increasing a pro-life worldview, especially among young people. But it's the very, type of thing that's happening in our high schools and our colleges and in our homes that is changing the tide on, on the issue of abortion. And right. it is an uphill fight. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it's like grasping like every single day. And it feels, I mean, I know we're weary. I know we're weary. But so yeah, on that, Ryan, what's your advice for, I mean, when people look at you, they say, "Wow, well, you're so energetic, you're so dynamic, creative, all these things, but I'm sure you get a lot of abuse, whether it's online or in person, hurled at you. How do you stay positive and how do you stay strong? 
I know why I was created. I know that I was meant to be. And I know that my, my story of brokenness can bring breakthrough to other people. And so when the focus isn't on, on you, but your love for other people, like for me, 1 Corinthians 13, 6 is my, is my foundational motivation. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices in the truth. I'm, I'm motivated by love. I was loved like crazy by two parents who had no idea what they were getting into, but who poured themselves into me. And so for me, it's a very natural thing than to pour myself into others. And so I'm hopeful. I'm hopeful because every small instance, every life saved, every mind changed to me is like every crazy effort, every night of exhaustion, every death threat that I've received is worth it because I'm able to play a role in human triumph. And so for me, that's why I keep doing what I do and I couldn't do it without my wife, Bethany, my, my best friend on the planet, the love of my life. And we keep encouraging one another. So, you know, maybe one day she quits and then I keep her going. And the yeah, other day you I support quit and one another. And, and Ryan, speaking Always. of the, the, that strong woman, Bethany, in your life, one of the videos that the Radiance Foundation put together recently was exposing the hypocrisy of so-called feminism. And it's heartbreaking, I think, for pro-life women to see things like Michelle Williams holding up her golden globe saying, I wouldn't be holding this if I hadn't had an abortion. And this, this really damaging message that's being put out there that in order to achieve that women need to have access to abortion. What do you say to that? Well, see, my wife was a single mom for two years. She was a teacher and she was pressured by her fellow teachers to abort because how could she possibly amount to anything if she didn't have an abortion? She needed the abortion to be a full woman, right? But she rejected that. She never actually even considered abortion, but the pressure on her as a teacher in her late 20s as a single woman was so intense, but she rejected that pressure. And because she rejected that, because she chose courage, because she chose to be stronger than her circumstances, that little girl actually is the name, the reason for the name of our organization. Her name is Radiance, my oldest daughter, whom I adopted when she was five years old. She radically and beautifully changed Bethany's life and just disproved that whole lie that somehow a woman becomes equal by abortion. No, a woman is equal because of who she is inherently. And the fact that Ray Ray, our oldest daughter, is just, ugh, she radiates beauty inside and out and she disproves the lies of fake feminism every single day. Finally, just to ask you, Ryan, for people watching today who I'm sure have just been inspired by the advice that you've given, practical advice, but if there's one thing that we could think about go going away with today to do what you chatted about at the outside, like winning hearts and minds, rebuilding a culture of life in Ireland, what can we do? I think we have to just keep in mind that doing what's morally right is rarely popular, but we have to get in our heads. Who cares? Who cares if it's not popular? Who cares if you're you know, the only one standing? Who cares if you're the only one listening? Who cares if you're the only one speaking? Courage does not need a crowd. It just needs conviction. Well, thank you so much, Ryan Bomberger, for joining us at the Pro-Life Campaign National Conference. Please, God, one day you'll be back on Irish soil again chatting to us. I can't. I can't wait. Thank you. And you can check out the work that the Radiance Foundation does and all their incredible videos that they make that you can share online with your friends, on your WhatsApp groups, on social media, at their website, which you can see on your screen below. That was phenomenal. I'm sure you'll agree with me. Ryan speaks so well. We are so blessed to have someone like Ryan in the pro-life movement who speaks with such conviction and truth and passion. Um, so we're just going to go quickly to the back to the social media comments because there are so many flying in. Thank you so much for your comments. Keep them coming because we're loving the feedback and it's great for everyone else to hear what everyone else is thinking. So we have one here, a comment from Neil Carmody in reference to the point made by Gavin Boyne when talking about his video, highlighting reality of the new law. Neil says, excellent point, Gavin. We cannot take for granted that people actually realize the full extent of what has been legalized. I think that's such a great point to make. So thank you so much for sharing. Teresa O'Donnell, really enjoying the conference. Congrats to all who are involved. The speakers are so inspired and I feel like there is great hope for the future. I definitely agree with you there, Teresa. That was one of the um, things that I was really hoping for with this conference, that we'd be inspired and motivated for the future in pro-life in pro -life Ireland. Um, Anne Newman says on Facebook, Gavin, your video is very powerful. Abortion survivors need to be heard. 
7,000 abortions already. How many lives has that touched? Boyfriends, parents, counsellors, and the loss of having a brother or a sister. Thank you so much, Anne, for sharing that. I think a lot of people forget that aspect that it's not just the baby and the mother, but there are so many other people who are affected by this decision and this choice. Um, okay, so we'll uh, share some more later. Um, but now we'll just keep moving. So I'm sure everyone is familiar with the Pro-Life Campaign Network. Um, people here watching might be involved in it already. And we have so many amazing volunteers all throughout the country. So I just want to take a special opportunity to thank you so much for doing everything that you're doing. It's so, so important, even still now and going into the future. Um, so as you know, the Pro-Life Campaign Network, they organise communications, training, regular web webinars, and they work with local activists on the ground all over Ireland. So now we're going to look um, and listen to Sheila, who's the Pro-Life Campaign Network Coordinator, and she's going to talk to some volunteers about what's going on at the moment. So stay tuned. Hello everyone, we're joined with four Pro-Life Campaign Network activists today spread across the country just to discuss and to have, have a little snapshot on what is happening at a grassroots level um, over the last couple of months. We have Siobhan Hall here from the Midlands, we have Brendan O'Regan from Wetlow, we have Gráinne Burke from Limerick and we have Lusan Lasala from Galway. You're all very welcome. Siobhan, I'll start with you, Siobhan. Would you like to tell us a little bit about the work that you've been doing over the last few months um, and your plans for maybe the next six months to a year and maybe any suggestions on what you'd like to see happening at a grassroots level in your area? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> I would have been involved in giving talks in churches. This is post-referendum and uh, it was quite, it's quite an interesting thing to do. Obviously, the lockdown put the kibosh on that for the moment. And also I was involved in church gate collections and there's a, a nice network of people around at loan who are involved in the pro-life who help out with things like that. Um, another thing I would have done recently enough is uh, I think letter writing is, a, is an area that people can always get involved in, uh, even in the middle of a lockdown. And uh, unfortunately, those stats that came out there in July of 2020 on the abortions day in 2019, uh, that was a uh, springboard for being able to write some letters to papers. Local papers in particular will pick up on letters. And um, also just keep your ears open on radio programs because often something will come up of, of importance and you can text in. Um, and that's uh, an area I can see people being involved in, you know, from the comfort of their own home. Another great area, and I know there'll be a lot more uh, talk about this, is uh, Community Connect, which I've been very involved in since its uh, launch there in November 2020. That's um, great, I Siobhan. Go into that, thanks, a, thanks a million for that, Siobhan. Same questions to you, Brendan. Hi. Um, well, after the referendum lull, I suppose, post-referendum, when we were demoralised a bit, but after that, then, we've kept our community going with our membership database and so on. Um, a lot of the work has actually been spreading the word to our members about pro-life campaign initiatives, say, nationally. And there's always something coming in that we can spread out to our, out to our members. For, just for example, petitions or the Community Connect and the Action recently, that kind of thing. We have been involved in lobbying as well, often prompted by the pro-life campaign in relation to the DIY abortions or the assisted suicide legislation that's going through. Um, We've had an online committee meeting since the lockdown, and that works quite well, apart from a few technical issues, I suppose. We've joined in as well with the webinars, the Saturday webinars that happened over the summer, and hope to see more of them. Um, th that whole PLC network thing has been a great booster to our um, morale, I suppose. It's created a nice structure for us. And for the future, I would like to see us getting involved more in Community Connect and supporting that subject to the lockdown of the course. Um, I would hope that we might organise as well on a weekly basis some sort of an online event. They're, they're quite easy to, to organise and I think they work well and we might be able to get some good guest stars. Personally, I've been involved in trying to get teachers together to set up and find good pro-life resources for school use and if anybody wants to contact me about that, that simplest thing is my email boregan at hotmail.com. Um, 
And a number of our members have been involved with the HOPE group in relation to the, to the raising awareness of how to assisted suicide bill. So can I put it all like that? Or maybe we're not going to do that. No, well, well done, Brendan, and keep up the good work in Wicklow. Gronia, over to you. What's happening in Limerick? Well, I suppose I got very active again with the pro-life um, since the beginning of this year and through Community Connect. I've always been connected with pro-life since the early 80s, since the initial um, referendum, but um, just got very active again through Community Connect and through the PLC network. So in, um, in Limerick, we would be very hopeful to extend the um, awareness of Community Connect within the, um, within the Limerick region, Limerick, Tipperary and Clare. And we'd be hoping that people could come on board maybe and develop our social media site. We're maybe falling down a bit on that. And that would be our hope for the next few months. And I think really um, keeping in touch with other pro-life people is extremely important for the future. Like you're keeping your ear to the ground, what's going on legislation wise and writing and texting and all the rest of it. But I find being, being part of WhatsApp groups is very empowering. You get the information, but also you get the support. And I think that's that's very important for all of us for the future to keep connected. That's great, Grania. Listen, thank you so much for all of the, the important work that you're doing in Limerick. We really appreciate it. And finally, over to you, Lisan, in, in Galway and with Galway for Life. How are things going there? Great. Um, uh, you, you would have heard from Nicola Davern, our uh, chairperson, last, at the last webinar, and she outlined a lot of the stuff we worked on. Uh, I wanted to mention something that didn't come up last time, which is when the unplanned film was released, we had three public screenings, which we used for fundraising for Gianna Care. And we had three sellouts, which was fantastic. A lot of young people, in fact, one of the sessions was especially dedicated to young people, students in particular, and all the funds raised went for Gianna Care. Then another thing we've done lately, it's we produce a very fancy newsletter, which I'm just gonna show you here. You can have a quick look at it. A massive thing which we are distributing to all our base, uh, several thousand people in Galway, and we're using it as an opportunity for getting people more engaged with uh, Galway for Life and corresponding with us and so on. And in fact, one of them, in terms of what we want to do for the future, apart from continuing to support the Future Leaders program, which has done a lot of good here in Galway, we had a, a session for Galway people before the lockdown. Uh, with 15 young students and uh, in one of the hotels in town. That was great. So the next one starting up in January, we want to contribute with Galway people, obviously. But one thing that's going quite well, I think, here in the West is the use of WhatsApp um, for keeping people in, in contact and informed and sending them articles and getting them motivated and active. For, for instance, for the newsletter, we had a group of volunteers in Shop Street uh, on a Saturday morning and they were handing out the newsletter. And this young woman came over to one of the volunteers and she said, oh, I can't believe you're handing out a uh, pro-life material. You've really made my day. I'm so happy. You know, and, you know that, to hear that is kind of wonderful because it means there is a pro-life awareness out there which we have to energize and, and engage with, you know? I think that's a lovely, a lovely note. I think that's a lovely note to end on, uh, Louis. On uh, thank you all so much. I think we're going to have to leave it there. Thank you all so much for for joining us today. You really are all, um, you know, an inspiration, and I hope that uh, people at home watching this today will be motivated um, and inspired by 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 listening to you and listening to the work that you're doing. Thank you all very much. Well done to every single person who took part in that video. That was so inspiring. Thank you so much for the work that you do. And thanks to all of our other volunteers who are also doing amazing work. Um, without you, we, our work really wouldn't be possible. So keep up the amazing fight and the passion and the strive to fight for the life, right to life. Our next contributor is Kelsey Hazard, who's the founder and president of Secular Pro-Life. She's also... Um, She's also a member of Equal Rights Institute's Board of Advisors in the US. She's a regular contributor to media debates in the US to the, on the right to life. And she works as a lawyer 
um, in private practice in Naples, Florida. So let's hear from Kelsey. Here with the conference for having Sorry, over her story. How did you get involved in the pro-life movement? So I don't have a great conversion story. I was never pro-choice or anything like that. But I first got involved as a college student. Uh, before that, you know, I'd been pro-life, but I hadn't really done anything about it. I didn't even realize I had grown up in the Methodist church. I didn't even realize that my denomination was an abortion supporting denomination officially. Uh, so for a while there, I was doing pro-life advocacy in direct opposition to my church, uh, which was not sustainable. Uh, for unrelated reasons, I wound up uh, becoming an atheist, but I continued my pro-life advocacy because it was always secular for me. It was always about human rights for the child in the womb. Tell us a little bit more then, Kelsey, about the secular pro-life approach in terms of communicating the message. So Secular Pro-Life, we have worked historically mostly with youth audiences. Uh, so we, ba back when we were able to visit college campuses in person, we would give presentations at college, camp co college campuses, uh, go to pro-life student conferences uh, and things of that nature. We also have a strong online presence, which of course has helped us tremendously during the pandemic. And to the extent that we're able, we do try to get in front of traditional media cameras as much as humanly possible to show the world that this is not just a Catholic thing or a Christian thing. We attend the March for Life in Washington DC, which is the United States annual event uh, commemorating the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. And we have a giant, I mean, 14 foot tall, bright blue, cannot miss it banner advertising secular pro-life and showing that this is a cause for everyone. Fine, Kelsey, in communicating that, whether it be on campuses or one-to-one, -one, where you're saying, you know, being pro-life, it doesn't have to be rooted in faith. It's, it's about human rights in its, in its essence. Are people still surprised about that? I think they've become less and less surprised. Uh, I, I think that we have gotten to a point where you have to be somewhat willfully blind to still believe that it's just a Christian thing. Uh, nevertheless, stereotyping remains a problem and we do need to do everything in our power to combat it. It's, it's somewhat, I, I know this is a bit of a paradox, but it's somewhat encouraging to me actually to see such reliance on stereotyping because that tells me that the abortion movement doesn't have anything better. They don't have a better argument. The science is on our side, the logic is on our side, and they're having to resort to ad hominems. And the best way to combat ad hominems is just to be out there in the world as a decent, nice, publicly pro-life person. What's the best way to do that in a practical kind of everyday way? Um, what's your advice to people who are watching? It's, it's, that, that is a great question. And it's, it's hard to identify because there are so many possible scenarios. I'll, I'll just, to, to, I'll answer that with a story. Um, I was going to a, um, to a, to a college campus. I had traveled pre COVID. This was several years ago. I was uh, traveling and I got a cab to go to the university and the cab driver this like kind of tough guy, tough guy, Boston accent starts asking me, oh, you know, where are you going? Oh, what are you doing there? Oh, you're giving a talk, what about? So we started having this conversation and I explained who I was and what Secular Pro-Life was doing. And he started crying. And he told me that his wife had aborted their child over his objection and there was nothing that he could do about it and that he hadn't been able to talk about it with anyone. So when you are out in the world publicly pro-life, you are pro-life in all, all the time and in every situation, and you just never know who you are going to encounter and what kind of traumas they have. So just always being ready, being, being a kind, listening ear. Sometimes all you can do is listen, and sometimes that's exactly what, what the person needs, is just someone to listen and affirm the dignity of their child such an important point Kelsey in terms of when we're talking to someone we don't know what they have been through and the hurts that they carry and so we need to really be cognizant of that and how we communicate with kindness and with love in terms Absolutely. of just your experience because you have so much talking to people and on campuses and everything like you've said what are the arguments that you have found have worked the most or been mo most effective in communicating the pro-life message 
it's going to depend a lot on the person, right? And I think the, the key when you're having a conversation about abortion is to ask a lot of questions. Because when someone says they're pro-choice, that really does not give you a whole lot of information, right? The pro-choice umbrella is very broad and there is a lot of internal tension there that they've been able to paper over because they have compliant media. But two pro-choice people may disagree on quite a few things. You you could have one pro-choice person who's just ignorant about the science, has never heard the truth, you know, just thinks it's a blob of cells and just needs to be educated. Um, on the other hand, you could have somebody who acknowledges it's a person, knows it's a person, but thinks that that sacrifice is necessary for gender equality. Those are going to be two extremely different conversations. And what's persuasive for one person is not gonna be persuasive for the other person and vice versa. So asking a lot of questions and knowing exactly what it is that you need to respond to instead of just talking past the person, that's what's key. So we need to make sure, as you say, we do more listening than talking in a lot of circumstances. Kelsey, yes. the theme today of our conference is 7,000 too many bearing in mind the huge increase in abortions Ireland has experienced since our the referendum passed. What are some things that you have seen in terms of being effective in reducing the number of abortions in the United States? I think you have to be active on all fronts. You know, often this is framed as a debate between whether we should be directly aiding women or whether we should be you know, focusing on getting good judges in the courts or whether we should be in our legislatures as if those things are pitted against each other. Absolutely not. We have to be active on every front. So you as a pro-life person, you figure out where you, your skills are the best fit and what you want to dedicate your time to and do that thing and have collaborations and coalitions with people who are doing the other things. It's not, there's no one silver bullet. We have to be on all fronts all the time. Obviously for a lot of people watching today, Kelsey, we're looking to where does the movement go from here and where are sources of hope that we can look to? Are you hopeful about the future of the pro-life movement? I am hopeful and yeah, I, I, I do kind of envy the religious people who can just leave it in God's hands and, and, and get comfort from that. I don't, I don't have that, obviously, but I, I look to history and I look and I see how every time we have dehumanized some group and said, this group, they're not really people. They can be discarded. Every time that has happened historically, it has never ended well, and future generations have always looked back in disgust and horror and have always, um, you know, felt sided with uh, the, the people who were working to end that violence. So I do think that we are on the right side of history. It, it's an overused phrase, but it's absolutely true. That is where I get my hope is to know that we are on the right side of history. If there was one thing, Kelsey, people watching today could use as kind of motivation for the future or something that they can do to advance the pro-life cause in Ireland, what would you say they should do? One thing? <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, it, it's hard. What do you like? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there, there are so many things you can do. I mean, just, I, yeah, and it's, it's so hard to give advice because every person is going to have their own unique contribution, right? Uh, maybe you have some money that you can donate. That would be fantastic. We definitely, money is definitely one of our greater obstacles. Uh, maybe you don't have money, but you can give of your time. Uh, maybe you have an extra bedroom in your home that you can allow, uh, that you can welcome a pregnant woman in crisis into your home. I've, I've had the privilege of doing that twice and it's been a great experience both times. Uh, you know, just evaluating where, you know, where you are and what it is that you're able to do and, and do it. Well, Kelsey, thank you so much for joining us at the Prolife Campaign's National Conference Virtually 2020. Hopefully we'll get to meet in the flesh one day, but for now, thanks for joining us. I'd love to. <laughs> Take care. Uh, great work, Kelsey. So we're now going to um, next hear from some church leaders on the defense of life and the importance of continuing to engage with people on the pro-life message. One of the 
The fantastic things about the pro-life movement is that we come in all shapes and sizes. We are a wonderful melting pot of all faiths and none. So we thought we'd have a discussion today with Pastor Nick Park of the Evangelical Alliance of Ireland and Bishop Kevin Doran, just on what we as a pro-life community can do next. The question, where do we go from here in a post-referendum Ireland? Pastor Nick and Bishop Kevin, thanks for joining us at our conference it's today. It's a pleasure. Um, I guess that's a good place to start. A uh, question to both of you is, so many people watching this today still feel very deflated mm -hmm. post-referendum and maybe that energy, that drive isn't there anymore. How do we get it back? I think for certainly those of us that are Christian believers, we get it back by our assurance that God is in control. And we, we can also get this from history as well as we look back to William Wilberforce and his campaign against slavery. It wasn't an overnight success. He had many heartaches and, and many setbacks on the way. And in fact, I think the final victory, the news of that reached him on, on the last day of his life. You know, so a setback does not mean that we have lost a cause. And we need to know from both history and from our faith in God that we have to press on. I, I agree absolutely. Uh, not most people know the song uh, by the rivers of Babylon, which was made famous by Boney M, uh, but it was originally one of the Psalms, and it's rooted in the experience of, of the people of Israel going into exile in Babylon. And there's a line in it that asks, how can we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? And I think the time in exile in Babylon was a time of renewal and conversion for the people of Israel even though it was very difficult. In much the same way, I think pro-life people in Ireland uh, feel themselves to be living in a strange land now. Uh, but we are still called to be people of hope. And it's important not to lose sight of the fact that God is with us in this strange place and the truth for which we stand uh, hasn't changed. Yeah, and it's really that focus, as you both say, where our faith can, can give us the hope that well, in the times when we feel hopeless, that God can give us back that, that sense of hope. From a practical perspective, though, where do you, and especially bearing in mind the times that we're in, it's challenging to plug into certain initiatives, but where should we be trying to put our focus and our energy in practical ways at the moment? Well, I think two ways. Uh, one, of course, is any initiatives that are going on at the local level with helping people that are uh, going through a, cr a crisis pregnancy and need help and support. You know, we need, to do, we need to do everything we can to support those local initiatives. But other than that, it really is a case of winning hearts and minds. Because, you know, before you lose a legal battle, such as the referendum, you, you've lost an argument battle and a convicting people battle. And so, and maybe people are still too much in that state of mind, kind yeah. of arguing rather than, as you say, trying to just talk. Yes. So, so we need to try and reboot people to actually respect all life. You know, we hear a lot of talk about how valuable life is dur during the current pandemic, but we want to see that translated to all human life. We, you know, uh, e even with suicide. You know that how can suicide be? okay under one circumstance and then dreadfully wrong in another circumstance and we need to make the argument that life is infinitely precious and that includes every aspect of human life. I think it's a really important point that idea of being pro-life for the whole life. Um, Bishop Doran in terms of churches and the role they have to play and again for, for, for both of you it's that situation where people aren't able to physically connect up with their churches but what role can church play in trying to motivate and activate Christians on the pro-life issue? I think uh, the role of churches is to motivate and uh, activate people through helping people to deepen and to reflect on their faith. And then uh, people are sent out on mission. And I think it's the thing that we tend to forget is that uh, in baptism, we are called to mission. Baptism is not just about getting a membership card. So, I think some people operate out of the belief that if the bishops would only do something, then everything would be fine. But I think intelligent people, and I hope I can include bishops in that, uh, understand that the place of the institutional church in Ireland has changed. Um, and maybe not a bad thing. The great thing about the pro-life movement really is that from its very beginnings, 
it has never been a creature of the institutional churches. Uh, bishops have certainly wanted to support and encourage it. But the pro-life movement is a grassroots movement, which includes huge numbers of people who are motivated by faith. Uh, Christians of every tradition, and also indeed Muslims and people of no faith. Um, and I think this is precisely the kind of activity that the Second Vatican Council saw as the essential preserve of the lay faithful, uh, motivated by their, by their own um, faith, which of course is nourished through their uh, religious gatherings and religious worship, which is one of the reasons why, why religious worship is so important, that it motivates our faith. One of the things that has been very positive in the pro-life movement in Ireland is an unprecedented working of different churches working together, you know, the Catholic Church working with so many different Christian traditions. How important is it that we build on this unity as a pro-life community? I think it's absolutely essential. I mean, that was one of the most heartening things from the whole campaign was the unity that we saw across denominational traditions. I found myself speaking in Catholic masses up and down the country, uh, and I grew up in, in Protestant East Belfast. So, I mean, that would have been unthinkable at, for most of my life that I, I would have seen that happening. And I do think we need to make sure that the pro-life message is one that affects everybody. The, the valuing of life cannot be contained to one group. And in fact, not just religious traditions, but even people's political affiliations. You know, I, I would sometimes find myself during the referendum, referendum campaign at events where other speakers would start talking about liberals. Uh, and I would always cringe a little bit because actually for us to win hearts and minds, we've got to convince people that even if they are politically liberal, they can still value human life. And if we, if we equate uh, a value and respect for the unborn life as only being synonymous with political conservatism. That you're then, putting it in an ideological box. Yes, we're yeah. alienating half the population. Yeah. Bishop Dorn, in terms of that, just building on that idea of, um, and hearing Nick share his experience, you know, where people were connecting up with different church groups and different Christian denominations, and there was a real energy and motivation. But how do we make sure that that uh, mobilization that we found and that unity in working together, how do we make sure that all that isn't lost and we can kind of build on it. Yeah, I, I think one of the challenges certainly for us is, is the feeling out there in society generally that uh, the line has been drawn under the, the pro-life question uh, and that the decision is made. And of course, the challenge facing us at this stage is to, uh, is to roll back uh, the decision and to gradually work towards the repealing of the legislation and it will take time. It may take, you know, 20 years to do it, but we have to do that by building up the relationships that we already have. And, um, you know, ecumenism, if you're going to call it that, we, we talk a lot about it, or we used to talk about it a lot, but it's now much more important that we actually just do ecumenism by, by working together. Just finally to ask you both, um, when we think of those devastating figures that were released in terms of the number of abortions, 6,666, um, again, so many people watching today, it breaks their heart, and especially, as Nick said earlier, at a time when everything we're doing is about valuing life, but it feels like only some lives what is the best thing that we can do to try and get the message out there of saying, one, we need to reduce these numbers, and also from our faith perspective, where I'm sure many people watching today, hearing those numbers, are crying out to the Lord saying, God, what is going on here? And feeling that pain. Yes, um, I mean, we had a situation in uh, international media where a celebrity couple recently suffered a miscarriage. And it was notable that in all of the discourse, it was that they had lost a baby. It was never that they had lost a fetus or a clump of cells. And I think there is that innate sense within every one of us, and certainly within every parent, that this is a human life. This, this is a child, and we can, we can never afford to, to lose sight of that at all. Bishop yeah. Doran, any final thoughts? Yeah, yeah. I think the numbers certainly were very discouraging, but not particularly surprising, because if you think about it, part of the purpose of having a constitutional protection for the unborn was to make sure that abortion never became the most obvious 
or readily available solution to crisis pregnancy. So now instead of saying to women, don't worry, or we're there, we're there to support you, the law simply says, don't worry, you can solve that problem by having an abortion. And I don't, I think the pro-life movement probably has to present itself uh, in two different ways or along two different parallel tracks. It has to clearly advocate for a repeal of the present legislation, but it also has to have a gentle face which invites women to seek support in whatever way it's needed. And uh, you know, when I when I was involved originally uh, back in the 1980s in establishing a group called Life Pregnancy Care, uh, you know, the focus was on uh, pregnancy tests and accommodation. And I suppose we've moved on. Pregnancy tests are readily available. Uh, Counselling is becoming legally very difficult. But I think uh, um, some pro-life movement groups are now offering uh, scans so that uh, parents uh, waiting for a baby can actually see the baby. And, and one of the things uh, actually, Bishop Doran, that's recently been set up is the Council for Life. Tell us a bit about that. Yeah, well, the Council for Life really is an advisory body for the Bishop's Conference. It's not to replace the pro-life movements, uh, but uh, it was it, it was set up uh, to uh, look particularly at how uh, the gift of life can be supported and celebrated within church communities. And, and also uh, it has provided briefings for the Conference of Bishops on how the church can respond pastorally and strategically to recent developments, both in relation to abortion and euthanasia. So it's made, it's made up uh, of, of uh, men and women with backgrounds in education, communications, healthcare, as well as theology. Uh, all of whom have a strong record of being advocates for life. But like a lot of things, of course, in the past uh, uh, year, uh, we, we have struggled because uh, we, we have um, obviously not been able to uh, meet face to face and all the usual challenges that are facing everybody at the moment. So we, we have to keep working on that. Well, Bishop Doran and sorry, Nick, do you want to jump in on that? Yes, I wonder, could I just add something about those numbers? because it's not just pro-life people who find those numbers disturbing. Now, I was at a meeting of church leaders uh, with, from various traditions and, and faiths with uh, the last Taoiseach, Leo Varadkar when he was Taoiseach, and a number of cabinet ministers were present at that meeting. And it was actually a former moderator of the Presbyterian Church who asked him a very pointed question. He, he said to him, Taoiseach, you said that you wanted abortion to be safe, legal, and rare. And at that time, we didn't have the full figures. We had an, an interim figure. And this pres former Presbyterian moderator quoted that figure and said, would you describe that as rare? And you could feel the air being sucked out of the room. And uh, Leo Varadkar said, no, I would not describe that as rare. And that is a matter of grave concern. Now, there is a temptation that we would say, well, it's, it's a bit late to be saying that now. But I think that is a reflection that the kind of numbers that we're seeing, it's not just pro-life people that are concerned, other people are. And therefore, it's a very good point to finish on. It's one of the things that people, when they are contacting their public rep representatives, especially those who push for this legislation, mm -hmm can ask that very same question, you know, that, that you just highlighted there. Well, that was a, a very interesting discussion. So my thanks to Bishop Kevin Doran and to Pastor Nick Park for joining us at our conference today. Thank you. Thanks very much indeed. God bless. It was so lovely to have the input from some of the faith leaders. Thank you so much to Father or Bishop Kevin and Pastor Nick. We're going to go over to some of the social media comments again. Um, they're flying in and they're so, so interesting. So thank you so much for all your contributions and keep them coming because we'll, we'll have another social media check in soon. So one from Pierre, uh, Pierre Pepper, I think. So uplifting to join in a pro-life gathering. The hurt of loss of the Eighth Amendment is now being replaced with resolve to restore protection for the unborn. I absolutely love this and I think this describes our mission this year and um, the future so, so well. So thank you so much, Pierre, for that. Um, Jared Stockhill, Planned Parenthood is the definition of systemic racism. 
Ryan's words need to be heard by more people. I couldn't agree more, especially in America. This message is definitely being uh, somewhat silenced. So thank you so much for that. Pauline Meehan in Monaghan says, the interview with the four grassroots activists has given me the most hope of all today. It would be so easy to sit back and do nothing, given all that has happened in recent years. But we have to keep the fight going, and you guys are inspirational. Thank you so much, Pauline. I think that is so beautiful. They are doing such great work, and there's so many opportunities for people to get involved in a pro-life um, mission. So if you're interested, um, there's so many opportunities. Just go for them. Um, another comment here from Dermot O'Dalig. I'm sorry if I pronounce your surname wrong. Not great with the Irish surnames. Uh, great to hear the human rights approach underpinning the non-faith groups so that all can agree on a common approach irrespective of the faith or ideology behind it. Well done on a good conference. I couldn't agree with you more, Dermot. The human aspect is so, so important. This is a human rights issue as well and it's so good that people remember that. Okay, so we're going to check in now with the great work of Community Connect, who do amazing work in supporting pregnant women in difficult situations. Certainly one of the things that has been so clear today is how important it is if we're to be authentically pro-life to connect up with practical initiatives that can support women who have an unplanned pregnancy. And one of those fantastic initiatives is Community Connect. And with me in studio to tell us all about it is Elaine Noonan, and she is their project coordinator. So thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me, Wendy. So Elaine, Community Connect, what's it all about? OK, so probably a lot of the viewers already know what Community Connect is. So it's a service um, that provides practical help to pregnant women uh, and new parents who are just struggling to provide for their baby. We're operating right across the country and we give uh, people items, everything from nappies and wipes right up to bigger items like buggies and cots. Um, and we also give a lovely new gift, uh, a new baby gift to the mums who contact us for help as well as the pre-loved used items that we have donated to us. So you've hubs all across the country where people can drop in these gifts, but how do mums get in touch with you? Is it through social media or do they just call you up? We have lots of different ways. So some phone us up. Uh, most come through the website, actually. We have uh, a form on our website and we do get contacted via Facebook Messenger and other ways like that too. And they all go on our list and they all get help. You've um, been able to help every woman that's gotten in touch with you so absolutely. far. Absolutely. Every woman in the country who contacts us, we will get to them. Yeah, absolutely. And what sort of feedback have you had? Uh, very positive. We get some lovely messages back from the mums who we've helped. So we've had um, feedback to say that like they were in situations where they just didn't know who to turn to. Um, they felt like they had nobody that could help them, um, uh, that we really took the pressure off. And a lot of them actually, it's very interesting, have said that um, they want to pay it forward and they want to give back when they're back on their feet and help other mothers who are in the same situation as them, which I think is a really lovely message to hear back from them as well. So it is, is it a much Elaine about the physical, you know, people having the, you know, the car seat or whatever they're, they're giving in to the hubs as that woman knowing somebody else is thinking of me and wants to support me in this situation. Yeah, well, some of the situations that we come up across um, are really difficult. I mean, we've had a few Mums contact us who have just left domestic violence situations, have nothing for their baby or their small toddler. Um, another mother recently who is expecting a baby and just lost her partner to suicide, which was a horribly sad situation. Um, we've lots of mums in homeless accommodation and lots of people just struggling to get by on the COVID payment who need a little bit of extra help. And they all say, you know, um, it's just great to know that this service is out there and that somebody can help me out of this difficult situation that I'm in. So, so, yeah. so far you've seen the huge impact that it's had. What can people watching today do to get involved and to help? So we're always looking for more volunteers um, and anyone who would like to volunteer. There's lots of different activities that people can get involved with from collecting donations to helping us to do the administration, to sorting clothes, all of those things. Uh, you can sign up on our website, which is communityconnect.ie or email at info at communityconnect.ie. Um, and also we're doing a big fundraiser, Wendy, I'm very excited about coming up to Christmas. Uh, and what we're doing is we're going to have a, a donate a baby box or donate a mama gift, or indeed you can donate both uh, if you wish. Uh, and you can buy the donation as a, uh, for yourself uh, to donate to us, 
or to buy it as a gift for someone else to give the gift of giving to someone for Christmas. Uh, so watch out on our Facebook page and our website for more information about that. Uh, and please, we would love as much support as possible to keep this initiative going. And presumably you need people volunteering their time as well. Absolutely. So all of our hubs are very busy uh, and we're always in need of more people to join up, uh, volunteer, help us to collect the donations, to get them out to the mums who need them, to wash the baby clothes, to wash the buggies and the cots, uh, and even to help us to promote what we're doing on social media and hang posters and all of those things. So we'd love to have more people involved to help. It's, it's great just to see how selfless people have been just in terms of giving their time and supporting Community Connect. Is it also just so important that initiatives like Community Connect are, are used as a way to really try and communicate with the wider community about the positive things that we can do to genuinely provide support for women in need? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, that's that's the beauty of this. I think a lot of pro-life people, we've been through a lot in the last few years, uh, you know, and we this is a really positive, constructive thing that we can all do, get behind. It really gives uh, a practical uh, help to people who are in need and as you say it shows people that there are people out there who care about them who are are willing to go out of their way to help them and who will volunteer their time to do that well thank you elaine for all the work that you and the many other volunteers have been doing with community connect and indeed to everybody who's uh, given donations and uh, all the bits and pieces it really is having an impact on women's lives and of course their babies as well which is the whole point point. and as elaine mentioned there if you want to find out more information if you want to get involved in any way volunteer your time or indeed Community Connect is definitely one of the positive and hopeful stories at this point of our, in our history. It's great to see such amazing initiatives like Community Connect and Gianna Care out there at the coalface helping m mothers and families. Congrats to everyone involved. Christmas Connect is Community Connect's Christmas fundraiser. It gives supporters a chance to sponsor a baby box or a mama bag which contains practical items for mothers and their newborn babies. If you'd like to donate or, may, or help out with this cause, you can visit Community Connect's web, website over the coming days, communityconnect.ie. Now, we're coming almost to the end of our conference today. I'm going to hand you over to Wendy, who's going to interview three more pro-life TDs and senators. After that, we'll be announcing the pro-life person of the year, so stay tuned. And I'm very pleased to welcome with us Deputy Matty McGrath, Deputy Patter Tobin and Senator Sharon Kogan who are very kindly joining us for our short panel discussion today. Thank you all for joining us at the Pro-Life Campaign National Conference 2020. Good afternoon. How are you? In many ways, because so much has happened, the general election might seem like an eternity away given everything that's been going on. Now, it received some media attention at the time, but I think it's worth revisiting the fact that all of the 15 TDs who voted against the final stage of the abortion bill in the Dáil were re-elected. Do you feel this is cause for hope for the movement in the future? Yeah, but I suppose maybe if I come in there first, if that's possible. Um, I suppose when I was canvassing during the election campaign, I noticed a significant amount of latent support uh, that, uh, for the pro-life view. So, you know, maybe one in every 10 houses that I went to, people said, no, no, you stood up for the rights of life, we're going to give you the vote. Other people were just happy that people had a backbone and they actually stood up for what they believed in in the election. So there's definitely a constituency out there um, that wants to see, make sure that everybody has a right to life um, and are willing to vote uh, for people with that view. On the, on the other side of the debate, many of the most, I suppose, hardcore uh, pro-abortion campaigners lost their seats. So um, I definitely think that it is a electoral advantage to be able to stand up for the right to life. One of the things, of course, that's happened in recent weeks is Gino Kelly's bill of assisted suicide and just this is the next anti-life issue that is being pushed. And you all find yourself once again kind of probably feeling in many ways feeling in the minority in that, maybe not in your opinions, but a minority in having the courage to express opposition to a bill like this. Yep. Yeah, I I, I'm, I don't want to hog the, the, the questions here, but, but I just very quickly, I'll, I'll come in and say, 
first of all, I would not underestimate the opposition that there is to assisted suicide in Ireland. And I don't think it just maps the, the general pro-life movement or community. I think it's, it's, it's actually wider than that. And I think people are shocked that a person with a terminal illness can't get a medical card, per se, in this country. And yet they looked to rush through this bill, through the doll, with 70 minutes of uh, debate and only four minutes given to the, uh, the anti-assisted suicide uh, perspective. So, you know, I, I definitely think that there is more hope potentially for this particular battle that we have. How does that feel, Matty, when you're in that situation where you're only afforded five minutes, as Padre Tavina said there, in terms of a 75 minute discussion? It doesn't feel very democratic. And the, the, the media at large, you know, didn't even really highlight this as an issue. Definitely, we would have got no time. They deliberately organised the structure of the parties that are on that subordinate on the left uh, to, to block all the time from us um, pro-life people or anti, in this case, the anti the end of life bill. But in fairness to General Kenny, he's a half decent person. And he gave us the four minutes. Only for that, we wouldn't have got a syllable in. So it's shocking. So it's going to be a difficult one. But like Paddle says, I think maybe there will be broader church there that would be against this when they see the situations regarding uh, medical cars and, and the situation, what happened in our nursing homes recently, you know, with the, in the pandemic. So I, w I would be still hopeful. Well, it's great to hear that. Sharon, as we said at the outset, you entered Leinster House for the first time earlier this year and congratulations again. What are your first impressions? What has your experience been like as you've been trying to operate in the corridors of power? power? Has it been different to what you actually thought? Um, well, Yes, absolutely. I mean, and, and things operate very, very slowly in here. Um, and uh, I suppose that within local government, you have a lot more power to get on and do the job. Here, obviously, things like that just don't happen. So it has been uh, very slow um, with regards to trying to get anything done. Um, people just don't operate at the same pace as I would like to operate. Um, yes, it is a little bit worrying, uh, this euthanasia bill. I wasn't expecting something like that to be even discussed during a pandemic, to tell you the God's honest truth. Here we are with people fighting for their lives. Um, and we'll, in the next couple of months, you'll see the many, many people that we may even have to choose who gets an, IC, an ICU bed. Um, and that is going to be absolutely horrific for families. And to choose, I, my mother is 83. Um, she has been diagnosed uh, last week with cancer. And imagine her life may not be as valued as a younger person, uh, if she does get COVID. And that is really, really sad. And that can, that might happen. Um, I did really... Um, is it all I then really about our attitude? I mean, when you consider, Senator, just as Matthew was touching on there, Matthew McGrath was touching on um, the scandal of what happened in the nursing homes during the pandemic, when we think of this push for assisted suicide, is it all about a lack of appreciation for those who are older and those who are most vulnerable? I think I, I think very simply it's not just a lack a lack of appreciation. I think we don't. Years ago, we would look after our elderly. You know, the the idea of putting our 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 parents into into even the 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 residential care units that uh, that people put. You know, um, that that idea didn't exist 20, 30 years ago. Um, now it's very common for people in their seventies to be put into to care homes. And there's so much living to be done. They may live in these care homes for 20 years and they're perf perfectly normal, perfectly healthy individuals. Um, but there's very little emphasis. And I think we don't appreciate our elderly enough. Um, we don't look after them. We don't look after them correctly. Um, and they have an awful lot to give to society, but we seem to want to push them away as if they're, we're done with them. Um, and I, I, I don't think that is right. I, I, yesterday, I did raise the issue about the terminal uh, illness, medical cards, not people having to fight for a medical card when they're terminally ill. Yet, in the years to come, or a couple of years, oh, but if you want to be euthanized, there you go, off you go. Mm -hmm. Like, it, it is, that's, 
the idea of that, what message is that sending out to the elderly? Yet to watch some of the political discourse, whether it's on <coughs> assisted suicide or whether it's on abortion, would be kind of shouting at the radio or the TV going, there's nobody here representing my point of view. Um, and you, you could really argue that, in fact, politicians are, are probably going to, so far in the other direction. You wonder, are they representing anybody at the moment? What is the best way to break through that echo chamber that's so frustrating at the moment? Well, just if, if I can come in on that uh, very briefly, um, and I've, I've made this point a number of times, uh, I believe that there are many, many people out there with our view with regards to the right to life at the start of life and the right to life at the end of life. Um, um, and I believe there's many people who do really good work and are working hard and are very focused. But I will say that uh, if you look at the other side of the debate, people who are pushing abortion and assisted suicide, they work phenomenally hard. They're, I, I think they're more politically focused. I think they're more strategic um, in general. Uh, I think they're maybe even harder working uh, in general terms. And I think, you know, there's, it, there's a very simple formula to be able to push that back. And that's for everybody to take, a, uh, to take responsibility. Like, I'm no more responsible for this, uh, this, this battle than anybody else. Sharon or, or, or Matty, you know, we are no more responsible for this battle than the people who are at home watching this particular show. And you know, people have to step up to the plate with regards to uh, that battle. Uh, for me, there's a very simple formula. It's you know, membership plus activism equals change. Uh, and if we can get people to, you know, who are of the similar views to ourselves, who similarly feel strongly as we do, to translate that into activism, maybe through the PLC or through backing uh, independence or, or backing uh, AIM2 in, in, in other constituencies. Um, that gives us a massive chance to push back, uh, but we, we definitely need, need to step up. And um, we're delighted in our own political movement in AIM2 that we've had such growth over the last uh, year and a half. And, and that's making a difference here in Leinster House as well, there's no doubt. Matty and Sharon, do you agree with Patter's point there that we need a bit of kind of injection of energy into our activism and that it's, it's very easy, you know, for to, to be a keyboard warrior, warrior or to be kind of lamenting, for example, what is happening in the Dáil at the moment on the discussion on assisted suicide. But if we're not doing anything about it, well, not a lot's going to change. Oh, sorry. Um, I'm worried that um, with the pandemic now and the fear that's been put through the television and put through our the media sources and the money's been pumped into it, the people are going to come out there and totally brainwashed and the objectivity in people and we can't even ask a question about COVID were demonized as unpatriotic and I'm worried about long-term damage that's going to do and um, you know that is a big issue as well. Well uh, you know I mean what Pather has said is, has said is quite true and um, I think we all need to figure out how we're going to how we're going to uh, convey the message um, with regard to what we have what we have to say going forward and how we do that in in a loving and caring and compassionate way. Um, you know, the, 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 the left side or the liberal side, it's very much it's very much thrown down pushed pushed on people and thrown down thrown down their necks. Whereas we have a point of view. I, I don't think any differently of another person if they don't share my view. However, I don't I, I don't expect them uh, to to rubbish my view, but I do want them to respect my view and I will respect theirs. Um, but if we can do that in a caring and loving way, I I, I think that's the end of the day. Um, but we do, it, it, those of us that do, uh, do give the pro-life message, we do get bullied. Uh, we do get uh, a lot of online abuse. Um, and I suppose really we have, to be, we have to be fit for that and know that, that that's coming and that's part of the journey that we're on um, because we are sticking up for, we're st we are sticking up for life at the beginning of life and the end of life. Um, and I suppose we just have to be able to take that. Um, but people, people on the ground there need not to be afraid as well. If we're sticking our necks on the line, they have to also get behind us um, and show strength behind us because we do need, we do, we, we do need support on the ground to know that there's other people that think like us, that we're not just out in the cold ourselves um, fighting this fight.
Um, so yes, so people need to encourage us as national politicians uh, and support us in the work that we do in relation to pro -life, the pro-life campaign. Well, maybe that would be a good place to kind of finish on briefly. You might just all give me your thoughts on, for people watching today, if there was one thing that they could do or think about in order to try and make sure we are rebuilding a culture of life, but also trying to make sure that voices like yours are heard in the political sphere, what can they do? Well, well from my own perspective there, I would say people should, if, they're, if they feel strongly about this issue, if they uh, are, want to fight for human rights, if they want to fight for compassion, I would say get behind Matty, get behind uh, Sharon, uh, get behind AIM2, um, become active, get behind uh, the, the PLC, you know, translate uh, our passive engagement on these issues into active engagement. Uh, because I, I've been involved in politics for 25 years and it's very clearly the people who turn up to the meetings make the decisions, the people who do the work, get the votes and change, change the world and the country. They have been all the time, you know, supporting other parties in the hope that they would, you know, see uh, that they would be pro-life or whatever, but they've found now that the other parties have abandoned the, the pro-life issue and want anything that's, you know, popular, populist and liberal. So people need to have the courage to join in to, to back to Sharon and, and Patter and the other uh, number of independents and uh, some some few within the parties, but the, they just throw their hands up and say it's party decision, majority rule. That's no good. People have to stand for life from, uh, you know, conception to the end of natural life. So, and uh, there's too much room for, uh, fluidness, uh, fluidity, and that's not good enough. We need to be energised and indeed support candidates who are willing to stand for their values. Sharon, have you anything to add? We need, we need to celebrate life and all aspects of life, all abilities and all disabilities, and um, we need to cherish that. And anything that, that, that the ordinary public out there can do to help us support the work that we do at national level and at local level, please just get involved and um, either with AIM2 or get involved with a, a, an independent throughout the country that is pro-life um, and support them and, and pray for them as well. <laughs> Definitely, because we need it. Well, thank you all, Deputy Patrick Tobin, Deputy Matthew McGrath, and Senator Sharon Keoghan. Thank you for joining us at the Pro-Life Campaign National Conference today. And thank you for all the hard work that you do. On your behalf, I would like to pay tribute to all of our elected representatives who continue to speak up for life. They are a wonderful group of people and we thank them for their dedication and courage. Let's commit to helping them in any way that we can. Before I hand you, hand you back to Darina, I have a short clip here from Michael Healy Ray, TD, who wishes the conference every success. I'm very glad to be given this brief opportunity to address the people who will be looking in, in this conference. I think it is so important that we still stick together, that we are still united in our belief that we all share so dearly to our hearts, and that is that from the moment of conception till the moment of death, the only person who has the right to take any person out of this world is God and no one else. I am very sorry that 6,666, which is obviously the most unique figure in the world, uh, young people were taken out of our world and denied the right to live by legislators and by people who saw fit to give the right to take away human life to somebody else. Sorry about that, we're having a few technical difficulties there, but that video will be available online again after the conference. Michael Healy Ray is definitely one of those pro-life politicians that we all need to support. I'm now going to hand you back over to Darina.
this is it for me. I'm done for the day. I just want to thank you all for coming to today's event. It's been such an amazing experience being here live in the studio with you all and bringing these messages and amazing speakers to you. Christina, thank you so much for the work you did today. She is amazing. We've worked together a lot in the past, but this was such a fun project today that I found out that Christina and me would be um, helping out today. I was really happy. So thank you so much. You were amazing. I'm sure everyone else is really happy as well. Um, so that's it, everyone. We're almost done. And I can't believe that we're almost out of time. So I'm here again with Eilish Mulroy. Um, I'm sure you'll recognize her again from earlier. And um, what are your, some, could you sum up today and conclude in your own words how today went? Well, I suppose just for myself, I found, you know, and you watch these things a lot and we're exposed to a lot of great pro-life material all the time in our work with the pro-life campaign. Mm -hmm. But I found today's programme really very inspiring. Mm -hmm. And I think it's really important for us to look outside of Ireland sometimes to see uh, mm -hmm. projects that are working in other countries and to be open to new ideas and, and a vision um, that ultimately will, will, will result in us restoring protection for the unborn child here in Ireland. Um, I suppose one of the things that I, I would strike me, what we saw today, I mean, it's just a, a small glimpse of the breadth and, and the depth of the pro-life movement um, in Ireland and all over the world. And, you know, it, let's be realistic. We have serious battles ahead. Um, in the short term, we absolutely must recommit to reducing um, the abortion numbers so that this time next year we're not in the same situation. We must do our utmost to really try and ensure that women who are contemplating abortion are given positive alternatives and given positive support. Um, certainly that's a short-term battle. There's obviously the long-term battle of restoring constitutional protection uh, to unborn children and their mothers in Ireland. And, of course, pro-life advocates um, will have known that the uh, euthanasia bill is currently going through the, the doll, mm -hmm. and, you know, we're all called on to, to work on that topic as well. Um, but, you know, on a, on a very hopeful note, it's, it's really inspiring to hear from all those people from all over Ireland and, and overseas and to be really aware of the um, depth of volunteer support for the pro-life position. Um, and, and, you know, we will commit and we will work on turning the tide on, on this topic, no matter how long it takes. Uh, one of the people who inspired me uh, in my pro-life journey um, was a man who's since gone to his reward, um, a Dutch man from Galway called mm -hmm. Jeff. And Jeff uh, came from Holland, a country where abortion is not really talked about anymore. Mm -hmm. And one of the points he used to make to us um, and, and uh, over the years really was that the, most, the biggest challenge for pro-life supporters and pro-life activists is to ensure that we keep talking about it that we continue to keep the issue high, in, you know, in, on the agenda and in the public domain. And as long as we keep talking about it, we have the capacity to make change. And I think that's really important for, for people to remember um, and people to be inspired by that. Um, and the, the longer I'm involved in the pro-life movement, actually, the more, the more I believe that. And on that issue of resilience and commitment and determination um, uh, from pro-life volunteers all over Ireland, it brings us nicely to the announcement of the um, pro-life volunteer of the year. And those who attend the RDS conference um, in uh, every year, the, which, which is where we normally are, as you know, Dorina, yeah. um, will know that we normally honour one of our key volunteers during that event. And just because we can't gather together today and hand over a trophy. It doesn't mean that we don't have many worthy contenders. And we decided to go ahead with the Volunteer of the Year Award uh, this, this year. And I think we have our Volunteer of the Year on Zoom. Um, and we may have a, a video or some pictures of her on, Zoom, uh, on the screen. Um, so uh, I'd like to present, if, if she's there, um, two viewers, the Pro-Life Campaign Volunteer of the Year 2020 and Maeve O'Hanlon from Cork. Well done. <laughs> so Maeve is there. Maeve, can you hear us? Hi, I can hear you. Thank you so much. Oh, thanks yourself, Maeve. And congratulations to you. Thanks for all that you do. And for those viewers who aren't aware of the extent of Maeve's volunteerism, Maeve has been very, very involved in the pro-life movement in recent years. Um, she's worked in the capacity as a spokesperson, as a local organiser, organising meetings. She's very involved with the Community Connect Hub in Cork. Uh, she's worked as a church speaker. 
Um, uh, generally, she's available and willing to be involved in whichever way she, she, she can. And she's truly deserving of this honour today. So Maeve, I, there's just one question really that we wanted to ask you today is, you know, what keeps you going? Uh, what keeps you so engaged and positive and committed uh, to this cause? Well, I suppose there's probably two things. One is I'm an engineer, so facts and figures are really important. And it was just a couple of years ago I started to do my own research and realised how little I knew about abortion. So when I realised that, I wanted to help get the message out about the truth of abortion. And that's a lot of what I focused on before and after the referendum with media and just sharing the truth and information. But through the pro-life movement, you very quickly realise how many women there are who find themselves pregnant and say that you know nobody told them there was support. And I realise that we, we don't hear anymore a lot about the supports. Thankfully, though, since the referendum, we're hearing a lot more about supports that are available. So one of my personal goals at the moment is that every woman in Cork would know that if she is pregnant, there are supports available for her. So being involved with Cork for Life and with the Pro-Life campaign, and especially now recently Community Connect, I really feel that's making such a big difference. And to be able to practically help women who, who literally come and they'll say to us, I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know where else to go and that we can help them with a buggy and a cot and, you know, baby clothes and things. They just didn't know where they were going to get. And there are so many people who want to help and so many people who need help. So I suppose that's really what I do is I connect the pro-life volunteers who want to get involved with others in Cork and with speakers and things like that, but also to connect um, women in Cork who need support and families who need support with volunteers and donors who want to help them. So that's probably what, what motivates me and keeps me going is, is helping. Thanks so much for that, Maeve, and we applaud you on all of that work and your, you know, it's real inspiration for all of the other uh, grassroots volunteers that are watching today from all over the country and even further afield. Um, so thanks for that. Um, Darina, I just wanted to um, take the opportunity then really to thank Maeve and all of the volunteers all over the country that have helped make this day possible and help mm -hmm. and to continue our work in the pro-life movement. Um, I wanted to also thank... Uh, our public representatives, the people who spoke to us today and others uh, who continually stand up for this pro-life position um, in, in Leinster House, in the Dáil and the Oireachtas, uh, to thank our faith leaders who promote this social justice issue amongst their congregations and very especially to thank um, our friends and our donors and without our donors of course none of, our, none of these events could happen and none of our projects and plans uh, could happen so it's really important to, to thank all of them as well and, and our friends of course and our allies all across the world in the pro-life movement and, and especially all the participants today um, so thank you to everybody so hand it back to you Darina Thank you so much, Eilish. That was um, that was actually so amazing to hear. I know I hadn't heard of her story and all the incredible work she's doing. So well done, Maeve, um, and to everyone else who's doing amazing work all around the country. So that's it, folks, um, for today. Thank you so much for staying with us and joining us for today's conference. Um, I'm sure you learned a lot. I'm sure it was a bit intense with all the information coming at you, but I hope that it left you with such an inspiration and a motivation and a fire to keep um, fighting the good fight and uh, to remember that not all hope is lost and we have so many more battles to face and we'll have many victories in the future please god so um don't forget to follow all of our social media um pages to keep up to date with what's happening we also have uh prolifecampaign.ie which is the website and that is where you can donate if you um enjoyed today's content um and as alicia was saying none of our work that we're doing would be possible without donations so please consider donating if you can um because it, it's all for amazing work um and if we really want to see change we have to obviously uh input in some way so thank you so much and thanks to obviously all of the donors around the country so hopefully next year uh we'll be able to see each other in person and we'll be able to have the conference back to normal in the rds um Pray. <laughs> Pray that all goes well and uh, that Rona will be no more. Uh, but for now, thank you so much for watching. Take care and God bless.
I'm very glad to be given this brief opportunity to address the people who will be looking in at this conference. I think it is so important that we still stick together, that we are still united in our belief that we all share so dearly to our hearts and that is that from the moment of conception till the moment of death, the only person who has the right to take any person out of this world is God and no one else. I am very sorry that 6,666, which is obviously the most unique figure in the world, uh, young people were taken out of our world and denied the right to live by legislators and by people who saw fit to give the right to take away human life to somebody else other than God. For that, I am forever sorry. I am so sorry that my efforts and the efforts of others were not good enough and I feel real bad about that every day of the week. But again, we must still keep united and keep focused and always remember what's right is right, what's wrong is wrong. This is wrong. And remember the politicians that wouldn't stand up for something will always fall for everything and they should never be forgotten and never be forgiven for what they did to the young unborn children of the future. Hi, I'm Maeve. I volunteer with Community Connect in Cork and over the last few months I've seen Community Connect in action and that's why I'm taking part in this year's virtual VHI Women's Mini Marathon to help raise funds for Community Connect. 